Okay, assalamu alaikum everyone. Welcome to today's PAL. Um, my name is Maryam al I'm a fifth year medical student. You guys may know me already uh, and you may not. Uh, either way, today we're going to be learning about the brainstem in neuroanatomy. And so I'd firstly like to start this off by showing you how I felt about brainstem when I was in second year. This is a very accurate representation. Um, felt like every single time I studied it, I never got to grasp it properly. And it was horrible. But it's also good to know that I'm not alone in that. And the lecture I'm giving you guys today, or at least the approach that I'm taking, is what I genuinely wish I had when I was in neuro in second year. Because this would have saved me hours on hours on hours of learning, and you're going to see that hopefully throughout today. So I know the brainstem is a very complex and daunting topic. And so what we're going to do today is going to make it as easy as possible, inshallah. It's, of course, like everything in medicine, not impossible, but we're going to take it step by step. First, we're going to look at what is a brainstem, right? And then we're going to understand the cranial nerves first, at least at a surface level. We're going to look at something called the rule of fours. I'm going to show you a trick to how to easily differentiate between cross sections. Okay. Then we're going to go through um, Dr. Ahmed Yaqeen Adin's anatomy slides edited or modified, let's say, um, with these rules in mind. And I have practice questions for you guys. So I divided this whole thing into three to four parts, and I'm going to give you breaks in between, of course. I just wanted to let you know from now the general breakdown that we're going to have, all right? So first and foremost, please get energized. While we're starting off the lecture, get yourself a cup of coffee, a snack, some water. We're going to be here for a while. And I also want to emphasize Please ask questions as we go along. This is your opportunity to learn. No question is a stupid question. If you guys want me to repeat something, that's what I'm here for, okay? So I just wanted to get that out in the open in the very beginning. So now let's start. What is the brainstem? Okay, so I'm gonna include a lot of pictures, so don't be afraid if it's a billion slides. It's just most of them are pictures to be able to get that visual cue in your memory. So what the brainstem is, I'm going to read it out and then explain it word by word. So it's the caudal portion of the brain consists of three parts, midbrain, pons, and medulla. So it's the bottom part of the brain, and it's basically what connects our spinal cord and our brain. And one thing I wish I understood a lot sooner is how everything is continuous. You know, it's not like the brain is one part, the brain stem is one part, the spinal cord is another part, although we learn them separately it's very important to keep in mind that everything is continuous. It's one pathway. It's just you call it different things in different areas, okay? And the brainstem is very important because it regulates autonomic function. That includes your breathing, which is respiration, circulation, okay? So it has some specific receptors and reflexes, all right? Lacrimation or crying, salivation, producing saliva, also controls your visual and auditory reflexes, which we're going to talk about later, and maintains vigilance, all right? And so, again, like I mentioned, it's a hub through which all ascending sensory pathways, descending motor pathways, and other local pathways of the central nervous system basically cross through, all right? So this is what we're looking at. So this is the brain, right? If you go down, this is the spinal cord, and these are the three parts. You have the midbrain, which comes from the mesencephalon, you have the metencephalon that gives you the pons and the cerebellum. And that's important. I just want you guys to keep in mind, right? This is our cerebellum. This is our cerebrum. Okay. And here, the third part is the medulla oblongata. Okay. So again, midbrain, pons, and medulla. And again, it's like a, it's a stem. The same way this is a stem of a flower. Beautiful dahlia flower I included, mind you, because that's my mom's name. So I just thought it would be a nice example. But think of this, this is the brain, this is the stem that connects it. And then think of, you know, the spinal cord as like the roots of a, fr a flower. So again, just remember, everything is one continuous pathway. And this is from Dr. Ahmed Qinuddin's slides again. So this is a real life human being, right? You can see here, this is the cerebrum, you can see the corpus callosum. Okay, and then here, basically this is the midbrain here. With the cerebellum, this is the pons. And then the continuation here is the medulla. And then that is going to continue thereafter into the spinal cord. All right. 
So now let's start with the first thing, which is what I want you guys to know. What are the cranial nerves? Okay. So this mnemonic is honestly <laughs> very applicable to neuro. And so it goes, oh, once one takes the anatomy final, very good vacations start happening. And I recommend you guys to just get a pen and paper in front of you so that we can write this all together. Okay. So again, O, once one takes the anatomy final, very good vacations start happening. So the first O is our olfactory nerve. Okay. The second one is our optic nerve. And the way I want you guys to remember it, olfactory means smell. Okay. Like olfaction to smell something. So you have one nose and two eyes. Optic is what gives you your vision. Okay. So that's how usually I used to mix up which one's the first one, which one's the second one. But just remember you have one nose, so olfactory and two eyes. So optic. Okay. And then you have your third cranial nerve, which is the oculomotor nerve. And what I'm going to try to do today, specifically with the names of the cranial nerves, is help you guys know what they do by the name. So oculo, okay, ocular from the eyes, motor to move. So this nerve mainly controls eye movements, right? From the name, makes sense. Same thing with optic. Optic means, you know, your vision. So controls vision. Olfactory means to smell. So just link these things because it can be a lot simpler than we sometimes make it out to be. Okay, you have the trochlear nerve, which basically makes your eyes go up. It innervates one muscle of the eye called the superior oblique. Okay, <clears throat> and then five is trigeminal. And the reason this nerve is called trigeminal is because it has three branches, as we'll see later in this lecture. So it basically goes into three branches. You have the branch near your eye, okay, which is the ophthalmic branch. You have here near your cheek, the maxillary branch. And then you have one here, which is the mandibular branch. So it's called trigeminal because there's three, okay? And then you have the abducens nerve. And so abducens, think of abducting, to move something away. And literally what this nerve does is it causes your eye to move to the side. You're giving someone the side eye. On this eye, you're using your abducens nerve, all right? And then for the F, we have facial. Facial, from its name, is going to control facial movements, including, you know, closing your eyes, closing your mouth, smiling, frowning, etc. Okay. And then after that, which is, so now we're at the seventh cranial nerve. The eighth cranial nerve is our vestibulocochlear. Okay. So vestibulocochlear Remember, from the cochlea in the ear, so it's controlling balance, okay, and it's controlling hearing, okay? So vestibulo cochlear is going to help us with our balance and our hearing. And you guys are going to learn more about the details of that in head and neck, inshallah. Okay, then you have your glossopharyngeal. So you guys might have come across the term glossitis, right, when you were in um, last semester, like in... Um, what is it called? HLS. Okay. So maybe one of the features of anemia you might have seen was macroglossitis. So inflammation, gloss means tongue, right? So glossitis would be inflammation of the tongue. And so when we look at glossopharyngeal, this nerve is controlling things in the tongue and the pharyngeal cavity in the pharynx. Okay. And so if you can link the name to its function, it makes it a lot easier. So it has a lot of different functions that we're going to talk about when we get there, but just keep that in mind. Glossopharyngeal, tongue and pharynx, all right? Then you have the 10th cranial nerve, which I'm sure you guys have come across before, which is the vagus nerve. And so vagus has a million different functions, but we know it's very important in our parasympathetic nervous system. It has branches um, for the baroreceptors, right? The carotid baroreceptor is very important for your heart, um, controlling the AV node, very important for your GI tract, right? So vagus is not something that's new to us. Okay, and then you have 11, which is the spinal accessory nerve. Okay, it's called accessory because it kind of looks like it's just hanging there. It's extra. And what it does is it controls the muscles that let you say no, right? Turn left and right. So it's controlling your trapezius, which is the muscles that help you shrug your shoulders, and your sternocleidomastoid, which helps you turn left 
and helps you turn right. And you guys can feel that. I'm pretty sure you've, felt, you've seen it in the lab. You can feel it on your neck, that muscle. The thick muscle here is your sternocleidomastoid. Okay. And your last one is hypoglossal. So remember what I said about the glossopharyngeal? Glossal here means tongue. So this is the muscle supplying mostly the, um, or sorry, the nerve supplying most of the muscles in the tongue. Okay. And so with that, we can see that we have 12 cranial nerves. What I'm doing, five, four, I literally just have them written down in front of me. Okay, so it's very helpful for you guys to sit with these mnemonics and just practice them again and again. And something I do, especially with these mnemonics, is the second you get to the exam, just write them down. Okay, you can sit for hours and hours or trying, or not hours, but minutes trying to remember that name of that one specific nerve. But if you have a mnemonic like this, just go ahead and write it down on the paper when you enter your exam, and it's going to make your life a lot easier. Okay, so now this mnemonic, oh, once one takes the anatomy final, very good vacations start happening. So now we know generally what these cranial nerves are. I'm going to reiterate what they do. Okay, so we know olfactory is for smell. And a MCQ they could get you, which you guys are going to learn about in the thalamic lecture, is the thalamus is a center where you relay all of your sensory information in the body and motor, except smell. It's the only cranial nerve without thalamic relay to the cortex. Not very important for the brainstem lecture right now, but I just thought I'd mention it. And what you're going to notice is here on the side, it's going to tell you some of these nerves are sensory, some of these are motor, and some of these are both. And so a way you can remember this is by another mnemonic. I know it might be a lot right now, but hopefully they're going to get easier as we go along. Some say marry money, but my brother says big brains matter most. Okay, so if we're going to write that down, some, next to, or basically what I would do is I would write down the cranial nerves and then Next to them, I would write down this mnemonic just as like S, S, M, etc. So some say, marry money, but my brother says big brains matter most. Okay, and so this can help you guys differentiate the functions of both. However, I'm going to give you a easier trick to know what's motor and what's sensory, but this is also good to keep these straight in your head. Okay, so we started with olfactory, right? We said it's for smell. Optic is for sight, okay? So if you have, let's say, optic nerve cut off, you would expect blindness in one eye, right? And then you have oculomotor. Remember, oculo from eye, motor means to move. So it controls eye movement, all of the muscles in the eye, okay? As well as pupillary constriction, which we're going to see in a second. Um, all except two muscles, superior oblique, which is controlled by your trochlear nerve, cranial nerve four. Remember, trigeminal is that really big nerve, right? The one that goes to your eye, to your cheek, and to your jaw, right? Those are the three branches. And so remember, according to this mnemonic, it has both. So our functions here are going to be motor, which is going to be mastication. So to chew, the muscles that help you chew. And it also has a sensory part. So facial sensation, okay, which is again in this, three, this distribution, as well as sensation from the anterior two thirds of your tongue. I know you guys are not going to remember this off the bat. Just want to mention these so that they get easier as we go along, all right? And then you have the abducens nerve or the sixth cranial nerve. Remember, abducens, abduct. So you're looking, you're giving someone the side eye. I know this is up, not side, but it's the best I could do with these emojis, all right? So you're giving someone the side eye. This eye that's looking to the side, this is where you're contracting your abducens nerve. It's controlling the lateral rectus. And this is purely motor. Okay. And then you have the facial nerve. So remember... You can raise your eyebrows with the facial nerve. You can smile. You can frown. And so it has both motor, which is what we just talked about, the facial movement, and sensory, which is taste from the anterior two-thirds of the tongue. And it also has extra functions. So parasympathetic, so lacrimation, which is, you know, tearing or crying, um, salivation as well, so producing saliva by the submandibular and sublingual glands. This is what it supplies. Again, don't worry about memorizing it now. We're going to get through it together. Then you have, <clears throat> sorry, then you have vestibulocochlear, which is for hear hearing and balance. And this is sensory. 
Okay. And then glossopharyngeal. So remember, glossal, so tongue, pharyngeal, pharynx. So it has both functions. So taste, sensation from the posterior, one third. Remember, anterior, two thirds is facial. Posterior part is glossopharyngeal. It's also important for swallowing. Salivation by the parotid gland. Remember, submandibular and sublingual are innervated by cranial nerve seven, which is facial. But parotid gland is by glossopharyngeal. It's also important for the carotid body, sinus, and chemobaroreceptors, and elevation of the pharynx and larynx by a stylopharyngeus muscle. We're going to get to that later. Then we have vagus, our favorite nerve, right? So it's also very important for swallowing, elevating the soft palate, which is going to come to be important later. So it has both, right? Um, motor and non-motor, or motor and sensory and parasympathetic, okay? And then you have your accessory or spinal accessory, which is important for turning your head to the left and the right and shrugging your shoulders. Okay. And then last but not least is motor, hypoglossal, which is for tongue movement. So I know this is a lot, but don't worry. We're going to go through it step by step. Now, the number one thing I wish I had when I was doing neuro is that this rule of fours was explained to me before we started the brainstem because I'm the kind of person that bought that subscription for Dr. Najib and spent hours and hours learning the brainstem only to find out in my fifth year, mind you, that I could have figured it out in not even five minutes. Okay, so I hope that this makes your lives infinitely easier. So the rule of fours is actually something that a neurologist came up with in order to help non-neurologists localize strokes more easily because it's a very complex topic and not everyone can just remember the brainstem off the top of their heads especially you know strokes are very important to recognize in all of medicine they're not exclusive to neurology so with that being said what is the rule of fours so remember how we have three sections we have the midbrain the pons and the medulla so in these three sections number one rule four cranial nerves leave each section so there's four above the pons okay four from the pons and four from the medulla okay and of these four remember we have 12 cranial nerves any cranial nerve that divides evenly into the number 12 you're going to find in the midline and i'm going to show you guys what this looks like in a second okay and the only exceptions are cranial nerves one and two because these arise above the brain stem um, and cranial nerves that do not divide evenly into 12 are lateral. So for example, here you'd expect to see in the midline cranial nerves 3, 4, 6, and 12. Everything else, 5, 7, 8, 9, all those are going to arise laterally. So this is what it's going to look like. So this is the medial part. This is the lateral part. So remember, cranial nerves 1 and 2 are just going to be higher up, so we're not going to count them. Okay, But 3 divides evenly into 12. 4 also divides evenly into 12, right? So those are from the midbrain. And then, okay, 3, 4, 5 doesn't divide evenly into 12, so it's lateral, okay? And then you have 6, which is in the center, okay? 7, 8 don't divide evenly, right? But now we have four cranial nerves. So we finished the midbrain, we finished the pons, now we go for the medulla. So we got to 8. 9, 10, 11, none of these divide evenly into 12, so they're lateral, they're to the side, okay? But 12 does divide evenly into 12, obviously, so it's in the middle. And what I encourage you guys to do is write this right now in front of you, sticky note, paper, on your table, on your hand, just have this handy and just practice writing it. It's very easy. One box, three, four, right? Another box under it. Six is in the middle line, and then you have five, seven, eight on the side. And then you have 12, and then nine, 10, 11, right? So long as you have this drawn, and you understand one more rule that I'm going to give you, you mastered the brainstem lecture. Can you imagine that? Crazy, right? And... I mean, I would say not to get your hopes up, but get your hopes up because this is genuinely the easiest way to memorize the brainstem lecture, okay? So now that's first thing 
where each cranial nerves arise. And so once you know this figure and you know what each cranial nerves or what each cranial nerve does, then you can understand, okay, I know where the lesion is because there's an oculomotor nerve problem. How do I know that? Because it controls all the movements except up and out kind of thing. All right. With that, we're going to add another rule or another component to the rule of fours, which is you have four motor tracts are midline. Okay. So M is for midline. And so those motor tracts are one, the medial longitudinal fasciculus, which I'm going to show you a cool video of how this actually works later on. Okay. And so what it does is it basically connects you your moving your eye to the side with this eye moving inwards. So you'll see later what I mean, but it connects how the ocular motor nerve works and the trochlear nerve. So when it's not connected, then basically one eye is going to either lag or be unable to look to the side. And you'll see what I mean when we come to the videos and whatnot. Okay, so one, first M, medial longitudinal fasciculus, or MLF. You have the motor tract of your upper motor neurons, all right, which is going to be your corticospinal tract, right? And so if you get damage to your corticospinal tract, which you guys know from the spinal cord lecture, you're going to get contralateral hemiparesis that is global and not focal. And so what I mean by this is if you guys remember the homunculus of the brain, when you have a stroke, let's say in the middle cerebral artery, it's because of the way the brain is distributed, it's going to affect the legs more than the arms and the face. But once you get down from the brain to the brainstem, there's no differentiation of these fibers. The corticospinal tract is one. So when you hit it or when you get a stroke there, your entire body is going to be weak on one side. It's not going to be weaker in the legs or weaker in the arms. It's just one side, hemiparesis. Okay. And that's what we mean when we say global, not focal. This, you're you're going to come to apply this more when we get to the, or when Fuest inshallah gives you guys the um, strokes lecture, but I just wanted you to keep this in mind. Okay. And then, so that's first, and we said MLF, and then motor tract of the upper motor neuron, which is corticospinal. Okay. And also corticobulbar, which is to the face. You have the M for medial lemniscus. Medial lemniscus is your dorsal column. So remember, the dorsal column is a very important for vibration and proprioception. So when you lose that, it's going to lose it on the contralateral side. And the last thing is what we just saw, right? The motor cranial nerve nuclei. So these are the ones that are factors of 12, okay, except one and two. So cranial nerves three, four, six, and 12, okay? So to recap, first we said Anything that divides into 12 is in the middle. Everything else is on the side. So four come from each section. Now we said four motor tracts are midline, which are our MLF, our motor tract of the upper motor neuron, which is corticospinal, our medial lemniscus, okay, which is the dorsal column, and our motor cranial nerve nuclei that divide evenly. Okay. Second thing or third thing is you have four sensory tracts that are to the side. So sensory is to the side, which means it's lateral. So we have our spinothalamic tract, which ascends as the spinal lemniscus. Okay, so you get contralateral loss of pain and temperature sensation in the body, right? You have your spinocerebellar tract. So spinocerebellar, so this is relaying information to the cerebellum. And so that's important for gait and whatnot. And specifically when patients have lesions here, they're going to have difficulty with RAM or rapid alternating movement. So basically, if we tell the patient to do this, they're going to be unable to follow that movement because you need coordination to do that, for which the cerebellum is important. Okay. Then you have your sympathetic chain, which, you know, cause dilation, sweating. So if not, you're going to have ipsilateral Horner syndrome. So meiosis, ptosis, and hydrosis, meaning you can't, there's no uh, tears or, you know, sweat from one side. You're going to have ptosis, meaning your eye is going to lag down a bit. Um, and meiosis, meaning your pupil is going to be small. Okay. Um, and last is the sensory cranial nerve nuclei, which we talked about, right? The things that are to the side, the five, seven, nine, ten. 11, right? The ones that don't divide evenly into 12. And so to recap, we said 12 is anything divides evenly into 12 is in the midline. Anything that doesn't is to the side. Four from each section, except cranial nerves one and two. Those don't count. Okay. Four motor tracts are midline. We said MLF. 
motor tract of the upper motor neuron, which is here, medial meniscus, and motor cranial nerve nuclei. And we said four sensory tracts are to the side, so spinothalamic, spinocerebellar, sympathetic chain, and our sensory nuclei. All right? Knowing this, you guys are almost done. Definitely, this PowerPoint is nowhere near done, but I just hope you know that. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to keep these two on the side of almost every slide that I give you guys so that you always see how you can relate this to what you're learning and make it much easier for yourself. Okay, so essentially, I'm going to always keep it like this. Remember, medial is motor and anything that divides evenly into 12. Okay, lateral or to the side is sensory. Okay and anything that does not divide evenly into 12. All right, so let's count the cranial nerves together. This long green one, this is your olfactory. It's going to your nose to smell. This is going to be your optic. This is the chiasm. And then these are your optic nerves branching off. And now let's start counting. The reason the cranial nerves are numbered the way they are is because they just went one, two, three, four, based on how you see them, okay? So this is cranial nerve three. And remember, it makes sense. We said three divides evenly into 12. So you see it from the midline, okay? And four. I know four looks like it's to the side, but it's because you'll see in another image later on that it comes from the back and it loops around, but it actually starts from the midline. And you see this giant nerve with three branches? This is our fifth cranial nerve, okay, arising from the medulla. Okay, and then you start from the middle again. This is sixth, your abducens, remember, it's in the middle. And then you have seven. And then you have eight, which is your vestibular cochlear. And then you go nine. And then you see 10, okay, 11, and then 12. Okay, so this is how they numbered them, essentially. But again, you see how this is your spinal cord and how it's going to be continuous with the medulla, and then that's going to go up and continue to your brain. So now we got through the key rules. We understood what is the brainstem, right? We went through the rule of fours. Now I'm going to show you an easy way to differentiate cross sections. So whenever you look at them, you know what you're looking at. Okay, so what I first want to emphasize is here. You see how this is your fourth ventricle? This is your medulla and this is your pons. So you can see how the fourth ventricle is part of the medulla and also part of the pons. So when you look at cross sections here, do you see this open space here and this here in the back? Those are parts of your fourth ventricle. So that's first what's going to help differentiate because you can see that over here in your midbrain, there's no more fourth ventricle. Now it's just an aqueduct. So you can see that reflected in the cross section. See how it's here and not way in the back? So this is the aqueduct, right? So first thing we do is we look at the presence of the fourth ventricle. So you can see it in this cross section. This is the medulla, by the way. And you can see it in this cross section. This is the pons, okay? But now how do we differentiate between the medulla and the pons if they both have a fourth ventricle? Well, it's something called the inferior olivary nucleus. So you see this really wiggly, weird looking thing. This is called, one. it's one of the olives, okay? Or inferior olivary nucleus. And these are only found in the medulla. And you'll see them in almost all of the cross sections. So if you see one of these olives and you see that, okay, there is a fourth ventricle, you immediately know I'm looking at the medulla, okay? So as long as you can identify the olives, that's easy. If you see a fourth ventricle, but no olives, then you know, okay, I'm looking at the pons, right? If you see no um, fourth ventricle at all, you know this is the midbrain. And it also has an interesting shape to it, if that helps you remember it. But just remember, here you have a fourth ventricle. Here you have a fourth ventricle. Medulla, you have an olive. Here, no olive. Here, no fourth ventricle. Okay? So those are the three things. We, we now know the rule of fours. And again, I highly recommend you write it on a paper and just keep it with you while we're practicing. And now you know how to differentiate between the cross sections, okay? Now what I'm going to do is going to go through the anatomy slides of Dr. Ahmed Yaqeen al-Din. Some of them animated, some of them not, I'll be honest with you. But just so you can see how all of these things actually arise. So this is our optic tract, all right? So this is the optic nerve, which is cranial nerve 2. And you can see that behind it, these are the cerebellar peduncles. So, you know, coming from your cerebellum right? Because we know the cerebellum is going to be in the back. Or sorry, these are the cerebral. Cerebellum is under. These 
here, this is going to be the pons, okay? And then here is your inferior fossa. This is the optic chiasm, the pituitary stalk, which is under the optic chiasm. You're going to have the mammillary bodies. Okay, this is where we want to get to. You see how this is the oculomotor nerve? Remember how we said it's going to be the first cranial nerve that arises from the midbrain, and it's going to be in the middle. You can see that here, sir. So this is our oculomotor nerve or cranial nerve three. And, you know, anatomically makes sense. If I have my optic nerve that's going towards the eyes, it also makes sense that the nerves that are mostly controlling the, the movements of the eyes are also going to be right under, you know, logically, subhanAllah. Okay, so th this is the medulla. These are the olives I told you about, remember? Like the weird squiggly things in the cross sections. Okay, this is your trigeminal nerve. The reason they're not showing the trochlear or fourth nerve is because, like I told you, it comes from the back and loops around. So trigeminal is this really big nerve that comes out. Okay, and then from the midline, we said is what? Cranial nerve number six, right? So this is our abducens nerve. Okay, and then after, here you're going to get your facial, which is your seven. After the seven, you get your eight, so facial and vestibular cochlear nerves. Okay, which are going to be here labeled. So you can see how this is labeled facial. This is labeled vestibulocochlear. Okay, and then you start to count the other ones. So your glossopharyngeal, which is nine, and then your vagus, and then your hypoglossal. And you see how this one kind of is going down? This is the accessories. Okay. Now, this is the same thing we're looking at. We're just looking at it from the side. So this is still the optic tract and the geniculate body. So now here, what you can see is the trochlear nerve. So it arises from the middle and then comes back and loops around, okay? But it's still one of the medial um, nerves, okay? Then you have your colliculi, which we'll talk about later. And again, this is the really fat nerve, trigeminal nerve here laterally to the side, okay? So this is again, just to orient you guys, midbrain. This is the pons, this is the medulla, okay? Now you have all the other nerves showing, okay? Facial here. So you can see how the abducens or the sixth nerve is coming from the middle. And then you can start to label the rest. You have facial, vestibular, cochlear, and then you count the rest, okay? I know the side view might be a bit more difficult, but regardless, it's exactly the same thing that we were looking at. This is a clearer picture, and I made sure to add these in the exact distributions that they are here in the image. So you can see midbrain, this is oculomotor, three, and then trochlear coming from the back, that's four. That's midbrain, right? We already. I'm just doing this so that you guys can follow the uh, diagram. Okay, and keep in mind, there isn't a particular reason, subhanAllah, that the trochlear comes from the back that I know of. It's just, you know, the way Allah intended it to be. Um, and then here you have your trigeminal nerve, which is five. And then you can start counting from here. Six, abducens. Seven, which is facial. And then you have your vestibular cochlear, which is here. Okay, so these are all the ones arising from the pons. So we did five, six, seven, eight. Now we go to nine. Okay, so we have nine and then 10, which is vagus. Okay, and then 11, which is spinal accessory. And then we go back to 12, which is hypoglossal. Okay, but I just want to make sure that you guys are following. All right, easy so far. If you have any questions, let me know. Feel free to unmute. Again, this is, I'm here for you guys to benefit and learn. So we're, we're basically done with the first part. I'll just show you again from the back. So you can really see here how the trochlear nerve, this is a trochlear nerve, is coming from the middle and then looping around. Okay. And then here, same thing. You can't see all the nerves because some of them come from the front. But you can he see here, this is five. You can see six. You can see here, this is, uh, sorry, five and then uh, seven and then eight. All right. And then oops you guys saw the cat picture too early and then you have something here called area postrema so area postrema is a very important part in the brain that is basically not covered by a blood brain barrier and the importance of area postrema is it's usually you no know, it can stimulate or not stimulate but sense chemicals in the blood and that's what triggers um 
some people to vomit. So people, for example, on chemotherapy, because there's these toxic substances in their blood, it's detected by the area postrema, and then the brain sends a reflux for you to start to vomit, for example. Um, yeah, and maybe not necessarily the most pleasant thing to end on, but we're going to have a five-minute break. I encourage you guys to write everything down. And I just want to know, is everything clear so far? Because if we really have the rule of fours and how to differentiate cross sections and everything down, then it's going to make the rest of this a lot easier for you guys. So just let me know, okay? All clear? Okay. Uh, at 7.45, we'll all be back. Okay, so welcome back from your break. I hope you noticed, but a lot of this is going to contain cat pictures. Um you know, for obvious reasons. So now let's go through the different components of the brainstem. One second. Okay, so different components of the brainstem. So you're going to see a lot of things, but the main thing that I want you guys to understand is that you have, just like in the spinal cord, sensory pathways and motor pathways okay so the sensory is usually ascending and that makes sense because let's say i touch something hot okay or i put something hot on your face your brain is not going to tell me that it's hot unless it gets that signal back so these are what we call the afferent signal so this is basically the information that's going to your brain for you to, to sorry for you to decide ouch this is hot i'm going to move away right and then you have your motor pathways, which are your descending pathways. And so these are usually dorsal, which means more towards the back, and then ventral, so more towards the anterior side. Okay. And so your motor pathways are descending. That makes sense. Your brain says, I want to raise my arm. Okay. So that's a descending signal that goes somewhere and then controls the movement. It's not the other way around, right? It's not like my muscle decides it wants to contract. My brain tells my muscle to contract and then I move. Okay. Same thing with the face. So if you want to smile, your brain decides that it wants to smile. But if I scratch your face, that pain sensation is going to be relayed and then you're going to have your response. Okay. You have other pathways as well, your cerebellar pathways, okay? And then you have cranial nerve, sensory and motor tract. So the sensory and motor from your body is one tract, and then sensory and motor from your face is another. That's why we have all of these nuclei that you'll see, and it's very complicated because of these cranial nerves that we learned about, okay? And then you have what is very, very important, what we call central pattern generators or CPGs. And so what these do is this controls your basic human uh, functioning in a way. So your breathing, okay, um, regulation of your heart, so your cardiovascular system, okay, uh, your reflexes, your rhythmic chewing, okay. And so the, the reason we're learning about this and the reason the brainstem is so important is because it controls these things. And what you, I'm not sure if you guys uh, took it in neuro yet, but one thing that's very important is what we call a herniation, uncle herniation. So essentially, if you have a part of the brain that goes down, because you know how the, the skull is, is hard. So what happens is if you have increased pressure in your brain for one reason or another, let's say there's bleeding, there's something else, and that causes part of your brain to go down, the immediate space it's going to go down in is going to be towards the brainstem, right? Because that's down and under. And when that happens, if you basically compromise these central pattern generators, you might stop breathing, not because you obviously want to stop breathing, but because you're no longer able to relay those signals. And so that's why it's so important to understand the brainstem, you know, from a medical perspective. And so I added a lot of pictures so you guys can get a better perspective of what we're looking at. So this is the basilar part of the brainstem, which you can see here. Okay, so this is the basilar part. All right. And then you have your tegmentum, which is this thing in light gray. And then you have your ventricles, which is here. Remember, we saw this before. And this is how we know to differentiate pons and medulla versus midbrain. And then you have your tectum, which is this part here. All right. So this is just so you guys get a perspective of what we're looking at. And you're going to see these tables a lot in um, your anatomy PowerPoint. And they're very helpful, honestly, to look at. But the reason I kept this one in particular is so you understand 
the types of afferent and efferent fibers. Remember, afferent is our sensory, sending up. Efferent is your action, that's your motor. And so for each of these, you have general and you have special. So what we mean by general, general is just general sensation, okay? So of your skin, your skeletal muscle, your joints, your bone. So these are things that are just normal, like pain, touch, temperature, things that you also have in your body. But if we look at um, special somatic, okay? So special somatic and special visceral, the reason we call them special is because we're looking at our specific senses. So your sight, your taste, your smell, your hearing, so all of these different uh, re receptors. And so special visceral means it's related to a specific organ. So gustatory, which is taste, and olfactory, which is smell. And then you have special somatic, which is your retina, so your sight, auditory, and vestibular, so hearing and balance. You have general visceral fibers, which go to your organs. Okay, and that's basically anywhere you can sense from. You're sensing either just normally, let's say on your face, or it's a special sense like smell or taste or something like that. Okay, and you have a similar principle that, app that applies to the efferent. So you have general somatic, which is, you know, I want to contract my muscle, I want to lift, whatever, smiling, all these things. Okay, and then you have your general visceral which goes to your visceral, means from the viscera, the organs. So this is going to go, oops, sorry, my bad. Oops, okay, sorry. <laughs> this is going to go to your smooth muscle and glands. And then you have special somatic, okay? Or special visceral, which we're going to see in a bit. Okay, so this is, again, I know this looks daunting, but we're going to go through it. So again, your afferent is your sensory. So this is everything going up. Okay, you have your general, your special, and then your, um, from there, somatic and your visceral. Efferent is the motor. So you have general somatic, you have general visceral, and then you have special visceral efferent. Okay, which we're going to see in a bit. And, okay, so this I know is again a bit daunting, but let's take it step by step. This is exactly what we just saw on the table. So you have your somatic general, which is what we talked about, our pain, touch, temperature, two-point discrimination, okay? And so this is somatic general. So remember, we're going to, again, see it more later, but this is mainly controlled by your trigeminal nucleus, okay? And you have these sensations by your V, which is your trigeminal nerve facial nerve, your um, glossopharyngeal, and your vagus, okay? And don't be worried about memorizing this now. We're going to have this more towards the end, okay? You have your special somatic, which is hearing and balance. Remember, vestibulocochlear. So this is the nerve responsible for hearing and balance. Makes sense, right? So this is your somatic special. And remember, these are your sensor, your afferent fibers going up. Then you have your general visceral, which is the nucleus or the tract, nucleus tractus solitarius, which is going to be responsible for cranial nerve seven, nine, and 10. And so we said we have your somatic general and special, your visceral general. Now you need another visceral special, which in this case is going to be taste. Okay, so your gustatory nuclei are going to be your cranial nerve seven. Remember, at least the anterior two thirds. And your um, glossopharyngeal, which is taste in the posterior one third, okay, and partially your vagus as well, but it's not as prominent as the others, okay. Then let's look at the motor efferent, okay. So these are the fibers that are going down, okay, instead of the fibers that are going up. So this is what we just talked about here. And now let's look at the motor efferent. So you have your general somatic, which is, you know, the movements that you are consciously doing, your skeletal muscles. So oculomotor, which is looking up, well, not to the side, but looking up inwards, down, whatnot, okay. You have your um, trochlear and your abducens. So that basically, these are all the eye movements. And you have this one, which is going to be your um, your hypoglossal, which is controlling the movements of the tongue. 
Okay, so these are your general somatic. So these are controlling your skeletal muscles, basically. And then you have your general visceral parasympathetic. You have cranial nerve three also gives you some parasympathetic fibers. You have cranial nerve seven, which is going to your cell, um, your salivatory gland, so submandibular and sublingual. You have your cranial nerve nine, which is going to your parotid, and your vagus, which is, of course, parasympathetic to a lot of the different organs in the body. Okay. Then you have special visceral. Okay. So that's your cranial nerves five, seven, uh, nine, and 10. So what you guys can notice is that, first of all, there's a lot of overlap, right? This one is in visceral, special visceral. This is also here, and it's also before in the sensory. So don't worry too much about memorizing this now. Just know that these cranial nerves have different functions, and we're going to learn about those as we go along. Okay, I just didn't want you to be very intimidated by those slides in particular. And so now let's go back to this. Remember what I told you? In the medulla, you're going to have the olives. Okay. In the pons, you're going to have the fourth ventricle, but no olives. Okay. In the midbrain, you're going to have no fourth ventricle, just this aqueduct. Okay. So I just want you guys to keep this in mind. So now we're going to start doing the cross sections, my favorite part, clearly. But before we go into that, I just want to re-emphasize, you remember the spinal cord, your dorsal columns, your corticospinal tracts, your spinothalamic tracts, which are basically this, the anterior lateral funiculi. So this is your spinothalamic. You see how it crosses here. Okay, lateral horns are for sympathetic. What I just want to really emphasize is that the way you look at the cross section of the spinal cord, I want you to start seeing how these elements are merging together so that we get to the medulla. Because, right, the medulla is the bottom part of, like, it's right on top of the spinal cord. It's how it continues. So just remember, all of these aspects are one and the same. They just shift around, become thicker cords, go to the brain, etc. Okay, so now let's start with the lower medulla, because we said it's right on top of what we just saw, right? It's right on top of the spinal cord. And so what I'm going to highlight for you guys is what is the main thing that happens at each level? So the main thing that happens in the lower medulla is what we call the pyramidal decussation. So pyramidal is referring to our corticospinal tract. Remember, it's one of the four M's that we said is in the midline. Okay. But the corticospinal tract, essentially what happens is they have to cross over at some point because we know that, let's say, the left side of our brain is going to supply the right side of our body and the right side of our brain is going to supply the left side of our body. So in that case, they have to cross somewhere and that cross happens at the lower medulla. So this thing here, the decussation of the pyramids, this is what we see here. Okay, you can also see here your spinothalamic tracts, your posterior spinocerebellar, and here you can start to see some um, nuclei of, you know, cranial nerve five. But I just want to mention that you remember how really thick and chunky cranial nerve five is. So it might not exactly follow this rule all the time. Just keep that in mind. Okay. So you have different nuclei. So this spinal tract and spinal nucleus are here. And you have these things called fasciculus uh, gracilis and fasciculus cutaneus, okay? So this is basically the dorsal column. You remember how the dorsal column was in the back? It's the exact same thing here. But what I want you to remember, okay, is the fasciculus gracilis, the L, think of lower limb, okay? And the fasciculus cutaneus, think of the U, is for upper limb, okay? So that's just an easier way for you guys to remember it. And so these fasciculi would be merging with the nuclei, which makes sense, okay? So again, gracilis is lower limb and cutaneous, the U is for upper limb, okay? And so again, the main thing that happens here is this, but you already know that. How do you already know that? Because you guys know your mnemonics, okay? We didn't get to any nuclei yet, but you know that the medial lemniscus or dorsal column is going to be midline right? You know you have your corticospinal tract that's midline. In this case, it's crossing over, okay? You, you're, well, the MLF we didn't get to yet, but you see, for example, your spinothalamic tract is to the side. Your spinocerebellar tract is to the side, 
Okay, your sensory or here like your cranial nerve nuclei are to the side. Okay, there's no sympathetic chain in this specific one, but again, I just want to emphasize that if you know these mnemonics, you already know what you're looking at for the most part. Okay, and you know how your spinal cord has a central canal? You can see how you also have one here. So just remember, this is all continuous. Okay. Okay, so now we're going to go a bit above that. So you see how this here was the crossing over of the pyramid? Now they're both separate pyramids. Okay, so these pink things in the front. And these are from the Kriqinidin slides as well, just so you guys can see them in parallel because you're looking at the same thing. You see this wiggly thing here? This is the olive I was telling you about. You see this? This is your fourth ventricle. So just by seeing the olive and seeing that there is a fourth ventricle, you already know you're looking at the medulla. Easy enough? Okay. So now let's look at what else we can see. Let's use this mnemonic to you know make our lives easier. We already saw that the corticospinal tracts are here in the middle. Great. What's next? This is the decussation of your medial lemniscus. Remember, your medial lemnisci are your dorsal columns. So first you have your motor that's crossing over, and then you have your dorsal column that's crossing over. So now we're in the middle of the middle. Okay, so this is the level of your sensory decussation. Okay, now you can see some nuclei. For example, hypoglossal. You know hypoglossal is here, right? It's cranial nerve 12. Is it in the midline? Yes, we already knew that because of our rule of fours. So you're basically, let's say I removed all the labels from this cross section. And I asked you, what is this nucleus here? You're going to look at it. You're going to say, okay, I see the olives, so I know I'm in the medulla. Okay, I know this is midline, so let me remember what's midline. You have my motor tract of the upper motor, which is corticospinal, here, checked off. Okay, medial lemniscus, which is here. So I know I'm in the middle medulla. It's crossing over right? Okay. I have my medial longitudinal fasciculus, which is here, this tiny thing, the circular one. Okay. And the last thing I have left is my motor nuclei. Well, I know I'm in the medulla, so I know it has to be 12. So by that rule alone, I know that I'm looking at the hypoglossal nucleus or cranial nerve 12. Okay. So I just want to emphasize that for you guys. Now, this side, this is a spinal root of the accessory nerve, which is 11. So 11 and 12 go together. And then this, it's like the other one. So here you can see your spinal thalamic tract. You can see your spinal cerebellar on the side. Okay. You can see, again, the spinal nucleus of the trigeminal nerve. It's just very long. It's giant. And you'll see that in a picture later on. Okay. I'll repeat. Don't worry about it. Okay. So all of these things you can see. I'm going to show this to you guys again on this image. Okay, so we know that, first of all, let's identify where we are. We know that in each section, you have four cranial nerves, right? And we know that now we're looking at the medulla. How do we know we're looking at the medulla? Let's look here. It's easier for you guys to identify. You see this wiggly thing? This is called our inferior olivary nucleus. So if you see this, and you see this fourth ventricle, by that alone, I know that I'm looking at a cross-section of the medulla. Okay? Clear enough so far? So first of all, I know I'm looking at the medulla. By my rule of fours, I know that the medial has to be a, anything that's divisible by 12. Out of these four nerves, the only thing I have is 12. Okay? So if I'm looking at the midline, I know that the nuclei, which is here, the hypoglossal nucleus, this has to be cranial nerve 12 because it's in the middle. So it's a multiple of 12, okay? Is in the medial lemniscal pathway sensory? It is sensory, but it's specifically the conversion of the dorsal columns first. And then you have your other sensory pathways that go with it, okay? Because spinothalamic is another sensory pathway. But medial lemniscus is just the conversion of the dorsal column. Okay. Got it. Now let's go through this again. We know our motor tracts are midline. Okay. So that's cranial nerve here, for example, in the medulla 12. Okay. This ML is 
the medial lemniscus, which at this point it will cross. Okay. What else do we have? We have the corticospinal tract, which is this, this pyramid that's labeled K and Z. Again, these two pictures are the same, you guys. I'm just showing it on one and then the other so you can tell the difference, right? So you can be able to identify them. Okay. And then we have the medial longitudinal fasciculus. Okay. Which you would usually find around here. It's basically this one, this tiny little circle. Okay. So we know the motor tracts are midline. We know the sensory tracts are to the side. Okay. So our sensory tracts, for example, I'll show it here because it's clear. You can see your spinothalamic. Okay your spinocerebellar, these are to the side, okay? The spinal tract of the trigeminal nerve, again, remember, it's just a very big nerve, that's why you can also see it in the medulla, okay? As well as the spinal nucleus, okay? Is that clear for everyone so far? We're just identifying what's here based on the rule, the rule of force that we already know. But I'm going to go to the next cross-section, it might become a bit more clear as well. Do you guys have any questions so far, or should I move to the next? Uh, excuse me, I have one question. Is the medial longitudinal in the same place as the medial lumbiscus pathway? Medial longitudinal fasciculus is, okay, here. They're very close to each other. That's why here it's a bit more difficult to identify. But do you see this tiny circle that's, let's say, clear in the center? Yes. This is our medial longitudinal fasciculus. Okay. Okay. Do you see yeah. these fibers that are crossing over here? Yes. This is the decussation of your medial lemniscus. Okay. okay. So if you look here, basically. Okay. Let me start actually here. You see your dorsal columns? Yes. So this is what happens first. This We, we know this from the spinal cord, right? Yeah. That's this the My mouse. Okay. Mm -hmm. This is basically still the dorsal column. Your fasciculus gracilis for your lower limb, right? Vibration two-point discrimination, proprioception, right? And fasciculus cutaneous is for the upper limb. This is still your medial lemniscus. Mm -hmm. But when you get to the middle of the medulla, what happens? They cross. It starts to cross over. This mm -hmm. is the level of the sensory decussation. Okay, makes sense? Yes. So when I'm pointing here, I'm just trying to show you that at that point, they're crossing over. But this is still your medial lemniscal pathway, and then it's going to ascend as one track instead of having, you know, like what, what basically was here on the, well, this would be the left side, right, mm -hmm. of the patient, is going to now cross to the right. And what was on the right side of the patient is now going to cross to the left. Okay. Thank Allahumma, you. what happened? No problem. What happens at the lower medulla is the pyramidal decussation. So your corticospinal tracts cross. What happens in the middle is your sensory tracts cross. Your sensory being, you know, your... Um, here, your medial lemniscus. Uh, the doctor told us MLF is the U, so long as it's in the middle. But to be honest with you, I'm just going off of what is here because I can't really see in very, let's say, thorough detail on this image. I'll be very fair with you. And it's already pre labeled. But if Dr. Yaqina Dean told you the U is the MLF, then, you know, we listen to Dr. Yaqina Dean. All right, Khalas, is that clear for us? The first of all, pyramidal decussation, and then we have our sensory decussation. Easy enough? Yes, thank you very much. Ahlo, Sahla. All right, so now let's move up. Okay, let's pay attention. So you can see how you can still see the olives here. If we go up, it's still the same, right? You can still see the olivary nucleus. You can still see the fourth ventricle. So by those two things alone, I know that I'm looking at the medulla. Okay. Now, although the cross-section might look a bit different, we're still technically looking at the same thing. Remember, our motor tracts are midline, okay? And so here, this is now the medial lemniscus after they crossed, okay? Here is your MLF, your median longitudinal fasciculus, which is, like you mentioned, labeled here as U, okay? And you have your other nuclei. Okay, you can still see the hypoglossal nucleus. Um, you can see one of the nuclei of the vagus nerve. Again, it looks like a lot of different labeling, but what I just keep trying to emphasize to you guys 
is if you know the M's or the motor tracts are midline, then you know what you're looking at, right? You know that the hypoglossal nerve, which is cranial nerve 12, is going to be in the middle, which it is here, okay? You have something which is very important, okay, that we call the nucleus ambiguous. Okay, the nucleus ambiguous, well, ambiguous means vague, right? And so it's a very, very important motor nucleus. And the reason we care about it is that it's very important to test our gag reflex. The reason they call it ambiguous or vague is because it's not specific to one cranial nerve. It's the motor nucleus for a lot of these different cranial nerves that are in the medulla, right? So you can see, okay, we know that this is the olive. So this is the nucleus ambiguous, and you're going to see that it follows a lot of the different tracts. If you want to look at it here, it's also here where my mouse is circling. It's also emphasized here in red. Okay, and so this is very important for the motor function of these nerves. So for example, it's very important for swallowing. It's very important for your response to your gag reflex, which we're going to learn about later. The control of your tongue, all these things. So that's why the nucleus ambiguous is very, very important. You have your spinal nucleus and tract, which is important for taking sensation from the face. Remember, spinal is V, is the trigeminal that goes all the way in your face. So this is your spinal nucleus and tract. And you also have your nucleus tract, the solitarius. So again, I know it's a lot. So let's look at it again in this cross section. Uh, only for cranial nerves in the medulla. Um, to my knowledge, yes, but I have a table for you guys at the end that shows you all of the uh, nuclei of the cranial nerves. Like it's a just giant summary table of everything you need to know. So don't worry, we'll get there when we get there. Okay. Um, so again, we know the motor stuff is midline, the pyramids, right, which is corticospinal. Okay. Our medial meniscus, which was the dorsal column, remember? It was, oops, it was here, but it crossed over. Now it's going up right? You have your medial longitudinal fasciculus, okay? And you have your motor or your hypoglossal nucleus, okay? Then that's in the midline, right? We covered all of these. Now we have sensory tracts to the side. So you still have your spinocerebellar, your spinothalamic, okay? And your sympathetic chain, which is not in this one, but you also have your sensory cranial nerve nuclei, okay? So you can see that here as your spinal nucleus and tract, okay? Easy enough, clear enough so far. And your sensory cranial nerve nuclei as well. But just remember here we have the nucleus ambiguous, which is very important for the motor function of your cranial nerves in the medulla, okay? Again, I know it's difficult to memorize this for the first time, just want you guys to make sure that if you see something, you you can, let's say, use your deductive reasoning to know what is where based on these rules alone, okay? And regardless of which section that you're looking at, so long as you know, olives, fourth ventricle, I'm in the medulla, okay? For comparison, let's go a bit higher. Above the medulla is the pons. So I know this looks scary, but don't worry. Um, so above the medulla, we have the pons. How do we know that we're in the pons? First of all, we see a fourth ventricle. But can you guys see any inferior olivary nucleus? Any weird wiggly thing here? No. So there's no inferior olivary nucleus. So we know that, but there is a fourth ventricle. So we know that it's the pons. That's the only other option, right? So what is the central cranial nerve in the pons? We know it's the sixth right? The abducens nerve that causes you to look to the side, okay? And we also have five, seven, and eight, okay? And they're going to arise from different parts depending on if you're in the lower pons or the higher pons. Remember when we saw how they were coming out from the sides? It's essentially going to be that, okay? But so what we have here, we're basically at the level of the facial colliculus, okay? And what you guys are going to notice here that is very clearly labeled is something called the trapezoid body. And so the trapezoid body is essential for 
the neurons that are coming from the cochlea, from the ear, okay, to send the signals of basically hearing. Okay, so they sign up with the cochlear nuclei. Okay, remember vestibular cochlear nerve, which is this one. And they basically cross to form the trapezoid body. And then they're going to ascend as what we call the lateral lemniscus. But remember, this is sensory. So the trapezoid body is just very important for your hearing. Okay, because your cochlear nuclei are going to, or your sensory fibers are going to go there. Then they're going to go to your brain and tell you, okay, I'm listening to music or I'm listening to people screaming, or cats fighting, or whatever it may be, okay? So this is just how you're sending these signals to the brain. But now let's say you have damage at this point. What are you going to expect to have? If you can't relay your sensory fibers that say, okay, I'm listening to this, or I'm listening to that, what do you guys think is going to happen? even if you get it wrong get it wrong now don't get it wrong later okay inability to distinguish sound that's a good guess but you can have any potentially loss of hearing right because if you can't relay the sensation that oh i'm listening to something then you can have right like let's say when you have damage to the vestibular cochlear nerve we call it ipsilateral deafness so deafness on the side of the lesion okay now here what else we see is we see bundles of the corticospinal and corticonuclear fibers. So corticospinal are the fibers that are going down. You know the corticospinal tract that we talked about. Corticonuclear fibers are essentially what we also call corticobulbar. So this is what's going to your face, okay? Or your, you know, from the cranial nerves. Okay, what else can we see? We can see the medial lemniscus which we know is midline. We can see the medial longitudinal fasciculus, which is also midline, right? So we said all of the M's here, we have our corticospinal and corticonuclear fibers, okay? We have our medial lemniscus, and we have our MLF. Okay, so this is all of the things that are midline. Now, what about sensory? What do we see to the side? So to the side, you can see the motor nucleus of the trigeminal nerve. Remember, trigeminal is a very big nerve, so you can see it all throughout the brainstem for the most part, okay? Um, and you can see also the main sensory nucleus of the trigeminal nerve. They're here next to each other, okay? Here you can see the middle cerebellar peduncle because do you guys remember the picture I showed you before, how you can see the pons and then the cerebellum behind it? So that's just what they're showing you here. Okay, um, yeah, so those are the main things that you can see here. You can also see the spinal lemniscus, etc. So now let's look at this here, okay? Again, we know that this is the fourth ventricle, okay? And we don't see any um, olivary nucleus, so we know we're not in the um, medulla, we're in the palms, okay? You can see the trapezoid body, which we said is where you have crossing of the cochlear fibers. Mm -hmm. And then you have corticospinal tracts here, which is basically here what's in pink. Corticospinal and corticonuclear tracts. Here you have your medial lemniscus. Here you have your MLF. You can also see it here just so I can show you guys. The MLF is here and it's also here. And here, at this level, they're showing different uh, nerve nuclei. So you can see the abducent nerve, which we know comes from the middle and goes out. This is for lateral gaze. And one interesting thing you find is that the facial nerve, although it arises to the side, remember, it's here, facial nerve, they're next to each other, six and seven. For some reason, it loves this nerve so much that it just goes around and then exits. So it's still originating laterally and exiting laterally but they cross together okay it's just you know an interesting fact to know but i just thought i'd mention it for you guys okay so let's go over it one more time how do we know we're in the pons well we see the fourth ventricle here and here but we see no inferior olivary nucleus so i know i'm in the pons because inferior olivary nucleus is only in the middle okay so I know in the pons, 
the nerve that's arising medially is the sixth cranial nerve. The nerves arising laterally are the fifth, the seventh, and the eighth, right? So, okay, so where is the fifth uh, nerve? You can see it, well, it's better labeled here, actually. So you have the motor nucleus of your trigeminal and your sensory nucleus here, all right? So these are to the side. You can also see, as better illustrated here, the nucleus of your facial nerve, okay, which is your seventh cranium. And what happens to your vestibular cochlear is that it crosses in the center, okay, to form the trapezoid body. So this is basically the, what's transmitting your sound or the sensory input from your cochlea, okay? And so let's look at the motor tracts that are midline. We know we have MLF. We know we have medial lemniscus. Okay. We know we have motor, which is corticospinal. Okay. And we have the motor cranial nerve nuclei, which is here, the abducens nerve, number six. And then sensory tracts are to the side, which you can see it better here. So you have your spinal lemniscus. Okay. And everything is ascending now. So you're going to also see your other stuff like your spinocerebellar tract and whatnot is going to go towards the cerebellum through this superior and inferior cerebellar peduncles. So just they didn't disappear. They're just going backwards to the cerebellum, okay? Um, you can't see your sympathetic chain here, but you can see your sensory cranial nerve nuclei. So we mentioned those are number five. Number eight is crossing. And number seven likes to go around and hug number six. Okay, so now we're in the mid pons. Is that clear so far? Easier than it looks, I hope. Since the cochlear fibers cross, when is the loss uh, ipsilateral or contralateral? So that's a good question. It depends. If you're hitting it at the level of the nucleus, like if it's before it crosses, then it's ipsilateral. If it's after it crosses, then it's contralateral. And um, what usually happens with these lesions is it's very rare to have a palsy of your vestibular cochlear nerve alone, even with strokes. So the times that you see vestibular cochlear nerve palsy or ipsilateral deafness is when you have something called a schwannoma, which you guys might have learned about. So you have the cerebellum, okay, and you have the pons. And the junction between them, this is where your cranial nerve eight exits. So if you have like um, a mass that's compressing it, that's when it usually has the lesion. So that's when it's usually ipsilateral. But you're right, if it is affecting the trapezoid body, then it would most likely be um, contralateral. Okay, cochlear fibers. Okay, so do you guys see this X here in the middle? It's what we call the trapezoid body, okay? So we know hearing is one of our special senses. Hearing is one of our special senses. So it's an afferent nerve that goes to your brainstem in the pons, is going to cross, and it's going to ascend to the other side. Okay? And when it crosses, it goes here in this trapezoid body. So it's going to go from one side, cross to the other. Your colleague was basically asking, if it affects the trapezoid body, wouldn't it be both sides? And she's right, it would affect both sides. Okay? So it would affect both sides if it's at the cross. But what I was saying is if this lesion usually happens at um, with the nerve itself, not necessarily with the trapezoid body because it's compressed by a tumor, most commonly like isolated cranial nerve eight deficits. And we'll see that a bit later. So don't worry about too much about it now. Um, but your question, so if the lesion is in the medial part of the pons, Will the facial be affected too? Um, in the medial part of the pons, it can be. It can be affected, but I don't want to go too much in depth with the stroke syndromes now because I want you guys to learn more about it as you go through it later. But with the pontine lesions, it can be in, let's say, here in the front. And if it's in the front side, then it's mostly going to affect the outward tract of your abducens nerve. So facial nerve won't be affected. Facial nerve is usually affected in lateral lesions, not in medial lesions. Does that answer your question? Okay. Um, is the part of the cochlear fibers clear as well? Oops. Sorry, guys. Uh, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, 
So isn't the medial meniscus or the dorsal column just sensory? But here it's in the motor tracts mnemonic. I know, but just memorize it as, you know, medial meniscus. Because, yeah, subhanAllah, like there's not much I can do to change it. I know it's not motor, but just remember at least the M's are midline and the S's are to the side. Bye, shukran. Okay. Okay, so assuming it's all clear for everyone, we finished two thirds of the brainstem. And I hope you guys feel good about that because you should. Now what we're going to look at is we're going to look at the midbrain. And remember, we mentioned before, how do I know it's the midbrain? There's no fourth ventricle. Okay. And you see this tiny little aqueduct here. And so the midbrain is divided into three parts. You have your tectum. Okay. You have your tegmentum. And then you have here, your, cr your crest cerebri. And the tegmentum and the crest cerebri together form your cerebral peduncles. Okay, so cerebral. Remember, these are cerebral, not cerebellar. Okay, so cerebral means it's just going to the brain. Tamam. And so this is how they're generally divided into three parts. Tamam. And we know that this is a midbrain section because we know how to identify the different forms of cross sections. Okay, let me... Now, there's two main levels of the midbrain that we're going to learn about today. There is the level of the inferior colliculus and the level of the superior colliculus. And it makes sense that the lower midbrain has the inferior colliculus, صح? and that the upper midbrain would have the superior colliculus, just, you know, by naming. As much as, you know, anatomists can be annoying, they're not stupid <laughs> at the end of the day, right? Something makes sense. A lot of anatomy actually makes sense if you look in the Latin roots of the words. Um, so at the inferior colliculus, what do you guys think we're going to be looking at? If we know that cranial nerve 4 arises under cranial nerve 3, we're going to expect to find our trochlear nerve. And I like to look at this cross-section. It really reminds me of like spider's legs. Oh, sorry. Here. Looks like kind of a mustache. So this, remember how I told you, you have your fourth cranial nerve. This is the nucleus of your trochlear nerve, how it arises in the midline and then it goes and it crosses over. So that's what's happening here. This is your nucleus of your fourth cranial nerve. It's going to come here and it's going to cross over to the other side. Okay. Same thing here. So it's going to go here and it's going to go and cross over to the other side. Okay, so that is in our midbrain. So the lower midbrain is where the fourth cranial nerve comes into play. Now, here we have the decussation of the superior cerebellar peduncles. Okay, so these are basically just going to the cerebellum. Okay, you have your aqueduct here, which we already looked at. Remember, we have your lateral lemniscus, which is where the cortical, um, the cochlear fibers crossed and ascended. You have your trigeminal lemniscus, which is basically sensation from the trigeminal nerve from the face. You have your spinal lemniscus, okay? And you also have your medial lemniscus. So here things start to look a bit different because now you can see all of the sensory columns are coming together. And that's basically what the doctor labeled here. You can see lateral lemniscus, which is here and then trigeminal, and then spinal, and then your medial lemniscus. So it's just showing you how the distribution has now changed a bit, okay? And remember, the key thing to know here is how the trochlear nerve is going to arise and how it's going to go to the side. And now all of our sensory fibers are starting to gather in one place so that it can relay to your brain, because makes sense, right? The midbrain is much closer to the brain than before. So everything is starting to converge. It's starting to come together so that it can relay to your cerebral cortex so that you can understand whatever sensation you're feeling. Okay. And so um, substantia nigra, which is here, is also important, but we're not going to talk about it today. And here. So this, I just want to make sure that this makes sense for you guys. The MLF or medium longitudinal fasciculus is still here in the midline, okay? And we have our inferior colliculus, okay? So again, from 
medial to lateral. Makes sense. Medial lemniscus is in the middle. Lateral lemniscus is on the side. Next to the lateral lemniscus, we have the trigeminal lemniscus, which is for the trigeminal nerve. Okay. Spinal lemniscus. Okay. Which is mostly from the body. And we know lateral lemniscus is really from the auditory cortex because we just talked about it. How do we know that? Because it came from here, right? From the crossing over of the cochlear fibers in the trapezoid body. I know like the cross sections might seem very um, separated, but just remember they're all continuous. So this is going to cross over as the trapezoid body. It's going to start as the lateral lemniscus. It's going to go up, right? The spinal lemniscus is going to go here, right? Next to the medial lemniscus. These sensory fibers of the trigeminal nerve are going to go up, right? So if you think about it, this is going to cross and go up. And then you're going to have your spinal fibers. Sorry, you're going to have your trigeminal fibers. And then next to it, your spinal fibers. And then in the middle is going to be your um, medial lemniscal fibers. So this is basically what we're looking at here. So from you have lateral lemniscus, auditory, trigeminal lemniscus, sensory from the face, spinal lemniscus, sensory from the body, and then your medial lemniscus or dorsal column. Okay, so just remember medial is medial, lateral is lateral, and then the spine is going to be closer to the midline of the body. Trigeminal face is going to be closer to the lateral because the trigeminal nerve is sensory and it arises from the side. Okay, I'm going to repeat that one more time. So here at this level, Essentially, what's going to happen is you're going to have your inferior colliculus. Okay, so we are at the level of the inferior colliculus. And so this is your center for the auditory reflexes here. Okay, your auditory reflexes for sound. Tamam. And so what happens at this level, we're getting closer to the brain. So all of your fibers are starting to converge into like thicker one pathway so that they can go up together. So what happens at the inferior colliculus level is the sensory pathways start to converge together. They start to become friendlier with each other. Okay, so they're organized from lateral to medial. Okay, your medial lemniscus, which we know is the dorsal column, is going to be in the midline, right? Makes sense. Medial midline, medial lemniscus. Okay, and then your lateral lemniscus, which we just talked about here, here in the trapezoid body, the hearing fibers, right? The cochlear nuclei that come and go back up to the other side from the trapezoid body, these are going to ascend here as the lateral lemniscus. And so when they ascend this lateral lemniscus between the lateral and the medial, and then we can start to organize the rest. So we know the trigeminal nerve is to the side. How do we know that? By the rule of fours. So it makes sense that it's near the lateral lemniscus. Okay, and this is our trigeminal sensory, so it's going up and basically relaying all of the sensory fibers from the face. So when you feel pain, touch, temperature, all these things are going to be through our trigeminal. Okay, then you have your spinal lemniscus. This is going to carry the other information from the spinothalamic tract from the body. Okay, so again, pain, touch, temperature, etc., these things. And this crossing over is just for the um, tracts that are going to the cerebellum, okay? Hope that makes sense. Are the superior cerebellar fibers going to the cerebrum or the cerebellum? The cortical fibers go through the middle cerebral peduncle. When the cerebellum send corrective signals, they go through the superior peduncle, or are those the fibers? Okay, this name. It's a very excellent question, but I'm going to save that for you guys once you get to the cerebellum lecture. Because if we get into the cerebellum now, it's going to be a lot more confusing for you guys. Um, but if you'd like, in the break, I'll look up the exact answer for you and let you know. But is that okay for now? Because I'm a bit worried that it might take a bit too long to answer. Okay. But for the level of the inferior colliculus, do you guys have any questions? Just remember, cranial nerve number four is going to go cross around to the other side, and you have the conversion of your um, sensory tracts. Okay, and your inferior colliculus, 
is going to cause a, uh, or it's very important for your auditory reflexes. Okay, so a lesion in the fourth would present contralaterally. I'm going to show you guys a video on the lesions. Um, so let's not get too ahead of ourselves now. But because it's a bit more complex than that, because it's moving laterally, but you'll see what I mean in a second. Essentially, the answer for that is yes, but I don't think it's in the way that you think. So we'll get there when we get there. And I'm, and I'm sure the video is going to explain it a lot better than I would now just with a picture. Okay. Okay. So now we're almost done home stretch. Okay. We're almost done with the cross sections. Now we're at the level of the superior colliculus. See how this looks like another mustache? That's usually how I just remember the midbrain. So the mustache that's going down, okay, or that looks like a spider to me, honestly. This is the level of the superior colliculus, the upper midbrain. How do we know it's the midbrain? Again, you can see the cerebral aqueduct here, right? And this is our superior colliculus. Tamam. So what we can see is your red nuclei, which is important for extensor posturing and your decussation of the rubrospinal tract, but I'm not going to go into a lot of detail with that, okay? This is exactly what we just saw on the other side, see? Medial lemniscus, and then the spinal lemniscus, and the trigeminal lemniscus, right? This is still your median longitudinal fasciculus, your MLF, okay? And um, otherwise, what's most important for you guys to know about here is the oculomotor nerve. Remember this very top cranial nerve, the oculomotor nerve, because it's going to exit from here and it's going to supply almost all of the muscles in the eye. Okay. So just remember that here we're at the level of the superior colliculus, which is very important for our visual reflexes. Okay. So superior colliculus, very important for our visual reflexes. And here we have the oculomotor nerve. How do we know what the oculomotor nerve does? Well, oculo, meaning, you know, of the eye, motor, movement. So movement of the eye, right? And you have something else, okay, that's called your Edinger-Westphal nucleus. I know that's a handful, okay? But essentially what the Edinger-Westphal nucleus does is it's important for the parasympathetic supply of cranial nerve number three. So we're going to see that in a bit, but just remember here at the level of the superior colliculus, we're focusing all about the eyes, okay? Because we're closest to them, okay? So you're focusing all about the eyes. So what we can see, first of all, looks like a spider, this oculomotor nerve that's coming out from here. And we know it's midline, right? Because it's divisible or it goes into 12, evenly factors into 12. Here, oculomotor nucleus, and then it's going to go down. And I know it's not shown well in this image here, but here you can see the edinger westphal nucleus, which is important for the parasympathetic supply of cranial nerve 3. Okay? So remember, superior colliculus, very important for our auditory reflexes. Oh, sorry, auditory, sorry, our visual reflexes. Auditory is inferior. Okay, so superior is for seeing, okay? So it's your visual reflexes, okay? And here you have your oculomotor nerve and your Edinger-Westphal nucleus, which is the parasympathetic supply for the oculomotor nerve, which is why it's important. Okay, do you guys have any questions so far? Easy enough, I hope. I know it's difficult like the first couple times around, but I really hope that with this um, algorithm on the side, it helps you guys differentiate without having to memorize a billion different things. And again, with the edinger westphal nucleus and all these little things, you're going to come to know them when we understand the specific function of each cranial nerves. But do you guys have any questions so far? Can I please repeat the last part? Okay, don't worry about it, sure. So we're in the upper midbrain. So it's upper, so it makes sense that it's the superior colliculus, right? So because superior means up, above. So remember that your superior colliculus is for seeing. This is very important for your visual reflexes, okay? And if we look at our rule of fours here, we know that in the upper midbrain, we're gonna have our cranial nerve three which is our oculomotor. 
So oculomotor, obviously oculo, so from eye, motor for movement. So this is very important for the movement of the eye, but it's also important for the parasympathetic supply to the eye. So that's why that's where this edinger westphal nucleus comes in. Okay, so these two together are basically going to go and supply the eyes. You have other things here, such as the red nucleus, which is important for extensor posturing. Okay, you also have your um, medial longitudinal fasciculus, which we know because the M's are midline. Okay, and we also have essentially what we looked at in the previous slide. Wait, I'm going to go back here, which is this the conversion of all of the different sensory pathways, it's the exact same thing we see here, right? Medial to lateral and spinal in the middle. Okay, so it's just showing you how everything is continuous. So just remember, lower midbrain is inferior colliculus, which is important for hearing. Okay, and remember that your eyes are lower than your ears, as they should be, right? So this is for lower, inferior colliculus is for hearing. Okay, inferior is for auditory reflexes. Okay, and this is when you have your sensations starting to ascend, right? Medial to lateral. This is the lower midbrain. Okay, and at this level, we have the trochlear nerve with its nucleus. How do we know that? Well, because we know that by the rule of fours, right? We see it here. Now, when we go to the superior part, remember, upper midbrain, the superior colliculus is for seeing. So this is for your visual reflexes. And here, based on the rule of fours, we have our oculomotor nerve. So it's going to come out from the middle and it's going to go down. It kind of looks like a spider to me. Come on. And you also have here your red nucleus, which is important for extensor posturing. Okay. And your edinger westphal nucleus, which goes together with the oculomotor nerve. Don't worry about this too much now. I'm going to really hammer it in when we get to the cranial nerves. Come on. Does that cover everything? Hopefully, like you guys have it at least like 50% memorized is enough. Because I promise you, if you know this and you understand the function of each cranial nerve, then answering any brainstem question is going to be easy, inshallah. So as long as you know the rule of force, you know the functions of each cranial nerves and what can go wrong, and you know the rules of how to differentiate between the three cross sections, you're golden, inshallah. Okay? I know that was a lot. So let's take a five-minute break. Are you guys okay with that? If you have any questions, again, always feel free to ask. I am here. Okay, silence is an answer. Five, inshallah. Okay, we're back. And I hope you guys got a good break and that you're ready for the last part. So what I want to reemphasize here is what we already know, right? The cranial nerves. So we already know the mnemonic, which is, oh, once one takes the anatomy final, very good vacations start happening, which is, I can attest to that, very true, especially in terms of neuro. So if you guys remember, in the very beginning, I encouraged you to do this, which is take this mnemonic, not write the whole thing down, but just, you know, letter by letter and number the cranial nerves. So that was our first mnemonic. And our second one was, some say, marry money, but my brother says, big brains matter most. And so if you have these two things next to each other, and then at the bottom, you write the rule of fours. I was, okay, yeah, at the bottom here, you write the rule of fours. Then any anatomy question that comes your way, inshallah, will be very easy for you to answer. Because you're going to know, first of all, for the most part, from the name of the nerve, what it does, okay? And by that, you're going to be able to eliminate and find the answer. However, I will mention one thing. In Anfasal style questions, they love to ask you guys about the nuclei. So because of that, what we're going to do is I'm going to teach everything to you in reverse and not in a bad way per se. What I'm going to do is I'm going to give you let's say oculomotor nerve this is what happens when it's damaged and then from that we're gonna scale back and see okay 
why does this happen when it's damaged so that you guys really understand it in terms of how to identify this clinically because in the end our goal is not to just be able to answer these anatomy questions on the final it's to be able to identify these things in patients in the future so that's why i emphasize how genuinely important this is because strokes are very common especially as people get older so you guys understanding this is for your benefit purely before grades or anything else comes into play okay so this is what we looked at before right all the cranial nerves so what i'm going to first start with is all the cranial nerves that have to do with the eye you're going to see that in the brainstem lecture we're not talking about the olfactory or the optic because they don't arise from the brainstem so we're going to start with oculomotor trochlear and abducens so we're going to keep trigeminal and facial together all right Okay, guys. So remember, this mnemonic. Some say marry money, but my brother says big brains matter most. So some say marry. So remember, oculomotor is motor, right? And it also has some parasympathetic supply, which we'll talk about. Okay, marry money. Fourth one, trochlear is also motor. And this is a purely motor nerve. Trigeminal is butt, so both, so ignore that. But now we're going to talk about abducens, my brother. So again, this is a motor nerve. So let's start with the oculomotor nerve. I told you from its name, makes sense that it has motor function. And it has it functions as moving almost all muscles of the eye, except superior oblique, which is supplied by our um, trochlear nerve, and our lateral rectus, which is supplied by abducens. Okay? So it has motor and parasympathetic, so it's a mixed nerve, and the parasympathetic is important, we'll talk about it in a second. It arises from the midbrain, but we know that, why? Because in our rule of fours, the third nerve is at the very top, remember, it's at the level of the superior colliculus. And so it's motor to extraocular muscles, parasympathetic to pupillary constrictors, and ciliary muscles. This is called accommodation, and we're going to see this in a second. So I just want to show you guys this, and you'll, you'll find a lot of these pictures in your anatomy lecture. I just want to re-emphasize so that when you get a picture like this, or if they happen to get you an actual cadaver, you know what you're looking at. So this is the long nerve here. This is your olfactory, number one. Okay, this, you see this optic chiasm here, and under it, this is the pituitary stalk. What's labeled number 14, this is when your optic nerve starts branching. Remember, this is to see. That's what your optic nerve is for. And then the first nerve you see from here, from the middle, which is the midbrain, is your oculomotor. So cranial nerve number three. So this is where we're at right now, where this red line is. Okay. So what you're going to see is that for basically all the cranial nerves, I added a table for you guys that has damage structure, site of lesion, what are the clinical findings, and then the anatomic basis or explanation. And I have this table on my Google Drive. I'll be sure to send you guys the link to everything, including the PowerPoints, inshallah, once we're done. But I just wanted to make sure that you guys know this so that you have access to it if you'd like to revise from it, because it's, you know, a lot easier than going through a lecture with a billion notes and having everything in one place. Okay, so oculomotor nerve can be damaged where? We said if either the nucleus or the nerve is damaged at the level of the superior colliculus in the upper midbrain, right? So what are the clinical findings? How will the patient present? He'll present like this patient here. You see how this eye is looking straight at you as a person normally would, but this eye is down and out. And his pupils, I know you might not be able to see it here, but his pupils are dilated. They're very wide. The black parts of the eye here, the pupils, are wider than they should normally be. Okay, let's understand why. So first he has complete ptosis. Ptosis is when one eye lid is a bit like lagging, okay, or down. You're unable to open the eye completely. And so he has complete ptosis. And this is because of loss of the function of levator palpebrae superioris. So that's the nerve that essentially causes your eyelid to lift upwards okay so if it's you can't lift your eyelid upwards where is it going to go downwards right so he's going to have complete ptosis he's going to have midriasis midriasis means widened or dilated pupils why we're going to see this in a second with a parasympathetic but you're basically going to get loss of function of the sphincter pupillae so 
from the name of the muscle, sphincter pupilla. It's a sphincter, so it's something that's going to tighten or close. It tightens the pupils, right? It makes it more smaller. And so if you lose the function of the muscle that's going to constrict your pupils, they're going to be dilated, okay? You're going to get ophthalmoplegia. So this is because of loss of function of the ciliary muscles, which I'll show you in a second. You're unable to accommodate which I'm going to show you guys what this looks like in a moment, okay? And you're going to get something called lateral strabismus, which causes diplopia. So diplopia means double vision, okay? And so we know cranial nerve 3 supplies all the extraocular muscles, except your lateral erectus and your superior oblique. So his eye here is looking straight, but the other eye is looking down and out, Okay, because of the unopposed force of lateral rectus, so pulling it out, and the uh, superior oblique that's also pulling it. Okay, so essentially this causes the eyes to go down and out. Okay, and so because of that, it's very important that we're able to identify this lesion in the upper midbrain. When you guys see the syndromes, inshallah, in the next lecture, it's going to be usually Benedict and Weber syndromes can cause this. Okay. And so remember, when you have an oculomotor nerve palsy, the eyes are down and out, and you have dilated pupils and ptosis as well, okay? You also have your, pu your pupillary reflex, which I'm going to show you in a second. So remember the Edinger-Westphal nucleus that I kept talking about in the superior colliculus of the upper midbrain? So you remember how in the section there was the oculomotor nerve nucleus, and then right on top of it in blue was the Edinger-Westphal nucleus? So essentially what this does is it's relaying our parasympathetic supply, okay, to the ciliary ganglion, and these ganglion names are important, by the way, they tend to ask about them, okay, and this is parasympathetic, so this is normally going to tend to us or cause us to constrict our pupils, okay, and so you're going to have pupillary constriction. Remember, or the way I think about it, you know, your sympathetic is your fight or flight system. So if you're trying to fight or, or run, your eye wants to widen. It wants to get in as much information as possible, right? But if you're chilling, relaxing, your parasympathetic nervous system is activated. So you're going to constrict your pupils. You don't have to see as much. Okay, that's how I tend to think about it. So this edinger westphal nucleus is what's giving us our parasympathetic supply to the um to the eye okay and so this is what's going to cause us to activate the sphincter pupillae which is going to cause us to constrict remember okay so now you have something else that's called our pupillary reflex okay which is basically when you shine a light in someone's eyes what's going to happen they're going to constrict right which i'll show you a video of in a moment and your efferent for this is your oculomotor now how do we understand the afferent and efferent for everything? Well, afferent is sensory. Your, your eye is going to know that light is shining in it if it can see the light, right? That's the optic nerve. So that's the sensation that's going back. And then that's going to relay to the brain and the brain is going to say, okay, my response to that is I'm going to constrict the pupil because the light is too bright. And the way it does this is by the oculomotor nerve. And the opposite is also true. In dim light, your pupil expands because you're trying to see more, all right? So this is, you see the constricted pupil and the dilated pupil. So this is what the pupillary light reflex looks like. See this? Okay, the music is really annoying. I'm not going to lie to you guys. But I just want to repeat that so you guys can really notice how the size of his pupil changes. Look at this. See how it shrinks and how it might be more difficult to see, but without the light, it starts to expand. And so that's what I wanted to emphasize for you guys. This is the pupillary light reflex. So what is happening when you shine that light, the optic nerve is sensing, hey, there's a really bright light in my eye. I don't like that. So it tells the oculomotor nerve to go through this pathway and constrict the pupil. So this is going through the ciliary ganglion. Okay, so these are our post- Ganglionic, and when we look at it at the parasympathetic fibers within the midbrain, it's the Edinger Westphal nucleus. Okay, so that's our. I'm going to show it to you guys one more time because 100% when you see these things, you will remember them. Okay, look at this. 
See how it constricts? So that's our efferent, is our ocular motor. Tamam. And now, okay. You guys are you guys are good. We can go to the next slide. So now I know this looks like a very horrible and daunting slide. So don't worry, just hang in there. I just want to show you what we already looked at. This is the Edinger Westfall nucleus, right? The parasympathetic supply, which is what caused that light reflex to happen. Okay. And our accommodation to happen. If we don't have it, we're going to lose accommodation or the ability of our eyes to adjust based on what we're looking at. Okay. And then you have your oculomotor nucleus, which is, you know, so this is basically at the upper level of the midbrain. See, this is the midbrain. This is the pons. This is the medulla. Okay. Goes down into the spinal cord. This here is going to be, you see this? This is the fourth ventricle. Here would be the cerebellum. So just so you guys get a view of what we're looking at. And here at this level, this is our eyeball. So it's right here, basically right here towards the back. Okay, so here, what this does is it's going to send us all of these signals. You see these red fibers? That's going to all the muscles of the eye, right? Superior rectus, inferior rectus, inferior, uh, inferior oblique, medial rectus. Basically, everything except superior oblique and lateral rectus. So you see how it's going to all the muscles, okay? And you can see how the edinger westphal nucleus, or accessory noted here as accessory ocular motor, is going to go follow along with it. And it's going to go here to the ciliary ganglion and travel via the short ciliary nerves to supply the muscle that we just talked about, the constrictor pupillae and the ciliary muscles that are going to cause um, our, us to have those reflexes we just talked about and we just saw. Okay. The other nerves that are mentioned here is sensory for cranial nerve five, which is trigeminal. And we'll see this when we talk about the corneal reflex, which is basically if, if you touch your eye, you're going to start to blink. You know, if anyone has tried putting on contacts, you've experienced that before. And that's because of your trigeminal nerve. And then the blinking is the facial. We'll see that in a bit. So don't worry about that now. But what I really want to focus on here, okay, is here, the edinger westphal nucleus. All right, and the oculomotor nucleus. So oculomotor is supplying all muscles of the eye, except the two, lateral rectus, superior oblique. And you have the edinger westphal nucleus, which is our accessory oculomotor that's giving us our parasympathetic supply. Okay, clear enough for everyone? And remember, the relay is via the ciliary ganglion to our short and long ciliary nerves. Come on. Okay, and this is again, so you guys know we're looking at this level. This is here, upper midbrain. Okay, let's just go through the table one more time to make sure you guys understand it. So ocular motor nerve palsy, eye is down and out with ptosis. Okay, why ptosis? You don't have function of the muscle that lifts your eye. Okay, loss of function of levator palpebrae superioris. You have midriasis. Why? Because you can no longer constrict your pupil. Loss of function of sphincter pupillae. Okay. Ophthalmoplegia. You have loss of accommodation. Okay. And you have lateral strabismus or diplopia because of the unopposed action of the lateral rectus and superior oblique. So from the nuclei and the nerves we just talked about, we said edinger westphal nucleus is the parasympathetic nucleus of cranial nerve three at the level of the superior colliculus. We saw this. Relays to the ciliary ganglion, biciliary nerves to sphincter pupillae and ciliary muscles. This is basically everything we just talked about in the video I showed you. Okay. And then you have your pupillary reflex. So you have your afferent is your optic and your efferent is your oculomotor. So remember, oculomotor nerve palsy, eyes are down and out with dilated pupils. And just to hammer it in one last time, remember bright light, you squish, you squeeze normally. If you have oculomotor nerve palsy, it's not going to react. Tamam. Just remember this video. Look. So here, our afferent fibers are going to be the optic nerve. And now it's sending reflexes to the oculomotor. And then through the edinger westphal nucleus, it's causing our pupils to constrict. Okay, so that's why it gets smaller. 
And when you remove the light, his pupils get wider. Easy enough, I hope. And this is just the video showing you with this context, what we're looking at exactly. Because I need your feedback. <laughs> Tell me, is it was it clear, unclear? Do you want me to repeat again? Clear, easy? One down, how many to go? Nine to go. Khalas, great. Alhamdulillah. Okay, great. So now let's go a little bit down. We did. We saw cranial nerve one. This is the olfactory, right? We saw two, which is the optic. And remember, if you're ever confused as to which one is cranial nerve one and which one is two, you have one nose and two eyes. Okay. Then cranial nerve three is going to be our oculomotor. That's what we just looked at. And also at the level of the midbrain, remember what comes out from the back and then loops around to the other side? That's our trochlear nerve, which is here labeled as 22. So this is what we're going to talk about next. Okay, our trochlear nerve. So we said oculomotor supplies all muscles of the eye except two. Superior oblique, which is supplied by trochlear that we're going to talk about right now. And the second one is our lateral rectus, which is supplied by number six, abducens, remember, to abduct. But let's see this now. Again, like I told you, everything is in the form of a table to make your lives hopefully a bit simpler. Now, we know that we're still looking at the midbrain, right? That's here. Now, because we're talking about cranial nerve 4. And 4 divides evenly into 12, so it's in the middle. That's our rule of 4s. Now, what the trochlear nerve does is at the level, first of all, of the inferior colliculus, lower midbrain. And you guys remember, inferior colliculus is important for your auditory reflex, right? Superior is to see, inferior is to hear. Okay, so what happens is basically you have the superior oblique muscle and you can see normally, like let's say I'm looking at my mouse and I tilt my head this way. One eye is going to tilt this way, right? And the other eye is going to tilt the other way as I'm tilting my head, right? So basically it's going to cause my muscles to stabilize when I'm looking from one side to the other. But what happens is if you have paralysis of this nerve, you're going to have inability of the superior oblique muscle to function. What that's going to lead to is intorsion of the eye. Okay, what does that look like? You can see in figure A, this is normal. This is how the eye normally rotates, right? If you tilt your head, in this case, to the left, your eyes are going to move to the right. However, if this is not working, you're unable to move the eye. So what happens is, let's say, this is with the patient's head straight. So this eye is slightly, by doing nothing, tilted to the side. Okay, so when the patient looks straight, they're going to have double vision. Why? Because this eye is kind of looking upwards. This eye is kind of looking straight at you. They're, they're a bit wonky, right? This eye is slightly extorted. It's moving to the outside because this superior oblique is unable to intort it or move it inwards. So you're basically, your eye is not in one line. It starts to move to the outside. Okay, so what happens in this case is the patient, because this eye is moved outwards, what they're going to do is they're going to tilt their head to compensate. Okay, makes sense? So they're going to tilt their head to compensate. And so what you can see in these patients, actually even in the clinic, is without feeling it, they're going to tilt this way because this is the only way they don't have double vision because you know now their eyes are on one line. So eyes are unable to look down when looking towards the nose. That's one thing. And patient tilts their head to compensate. Okay, so what your superior oblique does is it helps to intort your eye. So intorsion is basically movement. Okay, you see how this is moving out? That's extorsion. Okay, so your superior oblique is going to help move it back inwards. And it's also going to help move it more downwards. Okay, so this way. But because superior oblique isn't working, you can see that there's unopposed force here, pulling it to the side. So what the patient's going to do, they can't pull this eye back. The muscle is paralyzed. So what they're going to do is they're going to tilt their head so that now this is in one line with this and it feels like they don't have double vision anymore. Okay, so they usually have um, double vision, especially when trying to look down. It usually makes it worse. Is that clear to everyone? So this is uh, outward movement of the eye is lateral rectus. 
Okay. In ocular motor nerve palsy, what causes your eye, like if, okay, if you're following my finger and I'm looking to the side, the eye that's, or the muscle that's pulling this eye to the side, this is my lateral rectus. Okay. So what happens is if I have unopposed lateral rectus and superior oblique, my eye is going to move down and out. Out because of lateral rectus, down because of superior oblique. All right. So it's going to be a bit, it helps with intorsion. Because you see how maybe this is going to help it be easier for you guys. So the superior oblique is coming here, but it's oblique. It's to the side. So it's going to help pull your eye inward, in toward it. Okay, so tilt it more inwards. That's why in this picture here, you can see that when you normally tilt your head to one side and your eyes stay stable on one line, this eye that's moving inwards is supplied by your superior oblique, right? This is going to be another muscle. This is, you know, a bit more clear, not on my face, but on this image. See, so how it's going inwards in torsion is superior oblique. Extorsion is another muscle. But if you have no superior oblique in this side, you cannot intort. Your eye is not moving inwards. So what happens as a result is the patient tilts their head to compensate for that. Does that make sense for everyone? So out is lateral rectus, which is supplied by your sixth cranial nerve. Okay. Intorsion of the eye is from your trochlear nerve. So patient is unable to look down when looking towards the nose. So basically, if you can't move your eye in and you can't move it downwards, if you ask them to look towards their nose, they can't do it from this side. Let's say if this is where the side of the palsy is and vice versa. But what you'll normally see actually in clinics and whatnot is if someone has this nerve damage, they're actually going to, you're going to just find them tilting their head and they're going to be tilting their head all the time. And they're tilting their head because of this, because their eyes are basically not at the same line. So they're going to tell you, okay, whenever I try to look down, whenever I try to read, suddenly I have double vision. Why? Because their eye is not able to move down properly in that way. Okay. Does that make sense for everyone? See, so you can find it here. Cochlear nucleus. Remember, it's in the midbrain. Oops, here. In the midbrain, right? It comes from the back of one side and then goes and supplies the other superior oblique. Okay, so this is where the trochlear nucleus is at the level of the inferior colliculus in the midbrain. This is just showing you guys like what it is that we're looking at exactly. So remember, if they give you the cue in the question, um, patient has double vision when looking down, uh, patient comes with their head tilted, remember, it's because you can't, the eyes are not at the same level, basically. So you try to tilt it to compensate. Clear? One more time. Hold we're good. Clear? Okay. Wonderful. If you want me to repeat, I'll repeat. Just let me know. So now we're going to move to the abducens nerve. I know we went like three, four, and then six, but I just skipped the, or I didn't skip it, but I left fifth cranial nerve till after because I wanted you guys to understand all the eye movements first. So the abducens nerve, we know it arises immediately, and we know it's the sixth. So it divides evenly into 12, so we know it's in the middle, right? So it's medial here. And we know it arises from the pons. We saw that in the cross sections as well, right? Remember, you have the sixth cranial nerve coming out, and then for some reason, the seventh comes and loops around it. So that's what we were looking at in the pons cross sections. And so the abducens nerve is the most medial nerve exiting the pontal medullary junction. That's what we saw. And what happens if it's damaged is you get something called medial strabismus. Okay, so in medial strabismus, strabismus, what happens is you have more, your eye is more adducted. Remember, AD or adduction means moving to the midline. Okay, so so you guys understand this because it's also very important for neurology, right? If okay, this is my midline, right? My nose. If I'm looking to this side. This eye is adducted, adducted, it's to the middle. This eye is abducted, abducted, meaning it's going to the outside, right? If I look to the other side, 
Now this I is a uh, deducted, it's adducted to the middle, but this I that's looking to the outside, this is a b ducted. Think of like, uh, I know it's like a weird example, but abduction, like when child is kidnapped, they're abducted, they're removed, right? They're going to the side. So abduction is to the side, adduction is to the middle. Okay, so this is what this nerve does. But I want you guys to pay attention to this because let's say this patient has, um, you ask this patient to look to the side, okay? This eye was able to move, but this eye was not able to move. Although it looks like this one is kind of weird, the paralysis is actually here because this eye is unable to A, B, abduct, move to the side. So that tells you that there's paralysis of the lateral rectus muscle here. And this is actually the most common ocular cranial nerve palsy. So the most common problem that you will see within the cranial nerve supplying the muscles of the eye is not oculomotor, is not trochlear. It's actually the abducent nerve. So you can see it here, right? So we talked about the trochlear nucleus before. Supplies the superior oblique here. And the abducent nucleus is now in the pons, not in the midbrain. And it goes and it supplies the lateral rectus muscle. This is going to pull the eye to the side. Remember, you're giving a side eye. So you're using your abducens nerve. You're abducting the eye. Okay. And this is a video to show you guys and to make it more clear as well. For a sixth cranial nerve palsy. This patient has a right sixth nerve palsy. Mm -hmm. When he looks straight ahead, the right eye is deviated inward. See? So you see how, okay, so when you're looking at a patient, always remember your right is their left. So this is his left side. This is his right side. So you see that without anything at baseline, this eye is kind of moving inwards, right? It's, there's medial strabismus. It's moving more midline than it normally would. But now see what happens when they ask him to move his eyes to the side. When he looks to the right, the right eye hardly moves. See? When he looks to the left, both eyes move normally. See how here it moves normally? Well, I'm going to just repeat this for you guys to see. Ah, whoops. Okay, my bad. Deviated inward. Okay, look at this now. When he looks to the right, the right eye... See? When he looks here to the right, this eye is barely moving. Right? This eye is barely moving to the side. Although it should move to the side, but it's not. And it's not because you have paralysis of the lateral rectus muscle here. He's unable to pull his eye to the side. You can't give the side eye on this side. But you can see that when he looks to the other side, hardly it's moves. Really normal, right? When he looks to the... See? This is going inward. So AB duction is impaired here. But AD duction, adduction is normal. Left, both eyes move normal. See? He's able to A deduct, adduct. He's able to look to the middle, but he can't look to the side. So that tells you that the lesion is on the right eye, not on the left eye. Okay? So this eye can't move out, so it's abnormal. This eye can move in. Make sense? See? Out. So just don't be confused by if you see something like this. This is the abnormal eye not this one. I just want you guys to keep that in mind. I'm going to show you one more time on this side, on this picture, because I think it's a bit more clear. So remember, with abducens nerve palsy, first you're going to have medial strabismus. You see how her eye is not exactly in the middle? So it's slightly pulled inwards. That's called medial strabismus. Okay, the eye is AD, adducted to the middle. Okay, and this eye is unable to look laterally. So although this eye kind of looks wonky, it's actually this eye that has the problem. Why is the not affected eye deviated? The affected eye is deviated medially. So the lesion is on this side. So this would be left-sided. The guy in the video we saw would be right-sided. I'll show you guys the video one more time just to make sure to hammer it in. Okay, so here you have medial strabismus. This is the affected eye. You see how it's not exactly in the middle? Okay, here she's trying to look at her left side. But this eye is unable to move. Why? Because your lateral rectus muscle is paralyzed. So your lateral rectus muscle is paralyzed, so she can't pull outwards. So she's failing to abduct past the midline. So again, this is abducens nerve. Think abducens. She can't abduct. She can't look to the side. 
okay? And again, supplies the lateral rectus muscle. Trochlear supplies superior oblique. So I'll show you guys this one more time in the video, okay? So sixth cranial nerve or abducens nerve palsy. You see how this eye, this is the affected eye, okay? You see how it's, it's not in the middle. It's deviated medially. This is called medial strabismus, okay? And then when he tries to look to this, this side, okay, which is his right side, um, yeah, his right side. So you see how this eye is moving normally? He can look inwards here. This eye can't move outwards. He can't abduct this eye. So that tells you he has abducens nerve palsy of this eye. Okay. Give me one second, please. Okay. Sorry, guys. But is that clear how the abducens nerve palsy works? So if I gave you this patient, okay, I know this is a bad, like, okay, if I gave you this patient, it might look like that problem is here, but remember, the eye that cannot A, B, duct, that cannot go to the outside, that's the one that has the problem. So this would be paralysis of the, tell me, does he have a problem with his right or his left lateral rectus? Remember, this is, your right is the patient's left, his, you know, yeah, okay, perfect, right lateral rectus. How about in this patient? Is it problem with the right or is it problem with the left? Okay, perfect. Amazing. You guys got it. Khalas. Now, the next thing I want to show you is something that's a bit more complicated. Do you remember how in all of the cross sections, we had something called the median longitudinal fasciculus or the MLF? And so basically what I was just doing, if I look to the side, this eye is adducting, right? It's going to the middle. This eye is abducting, going to the side. This is lateral rectus, which is supplied by the abducens nerve, like we just saw. But me moving my eye inward, that's from the oculomotor. So how do I know, or how does my brain know, to make sure my oculomotor nerve and my lateral rectus, or the abducens nerve, fire at the same time? There has to be something that links them together when I'm trying to look to the side, right? I'm trying to look to this side. Otherwise, I can't follow an object. Otherwise, one eye is going to move to one side. The other eye is going to move to the other side, right? There has to be a connection that tells my eyes, okay, contract this lateral rectus, okay, and use the oculomotor nerve here at the same time. So what that does or how that happens is because of the MLF, the median longitudinal fasciculus basically connects those two nerves together to allow you to be able to look at something in a proper movement, right? Or like be able to track something properly with your eyes. So when we have damage to the MLF, we have something called intranuclear ophthalmoplegia. And I know it's a very, um, it can be a very difficult concept to understand. So that's why I wanted to include a video to show you guys. Okay, it's a bit of a longer video, but let's start from here. Okay. Plegias. This patient had subacute bacterial endocarditis with a bacterial... Okay, do you see how this eye, I want you to pay attention to this eye and see how it starts to twitch and how when he looks to the side, they're not in sync. Abscess in the brainstem. Okay. I want you to see how like there's a lag between... Ductions and gaze are fairly full looking to the right, mm -hmm. but look at this. When looking to the left, his right eye does not adduct well. See, and... his right eye is not able to ad it's not able to adduct properly and then in his left eye it starts to twitch or this is do you see this twitching this is what we call nystagmus so he has horizontal nystagmus in his left eye okay um and he has inability to adduct properly in his right eye you can see these jerk ab you can see how here it's normal left eye. this can so he has a right adduct properly Again, the components are medial duction abnormalities of the ipsilateral eye and AB ducting the stagmus of the contralateral eye. So basically, wait, I'll show you here. Okay, 
So you see how this, you can't, basically you still see some whites of the eyes here. That's how it tells you that there's adduction problems. He's not able to fully look here. And so this is the ipsilateral eye that tells you you have damage to the right MLF. The eye that's twitching, although it might look like, oh, this one looks like the one that's damaged, this is actually the normal side. Okay, so technically his left side is normal. The lesion is in the right MLF. Our okay, I just want to make sure you guys abnormalities of the ipsilateral eye and AB ducting the stagmas of the contralateral eye. Now these are really brought out with saccades. This is a nice technique to bring out. See? This eye can't go here into the middle properly. This eye starts to twitch, has an astagmus. Nine L. See? So the side is not this side with an astagmus. So he doesn't have a left-sided lesion. He actually has a right-sided lesion. That's the patient to saccade so here quickly to the right, as he's done here, normal to the left. Now look at the lag of the medial duction of that right eye. Look here. at how it's See lagging. How it See how it's not, ba it's basically not at the same line? Sort of slowly drifts across. That's a nice way to bring out a subtle INO. I think it shows up fairly nicely. Look at the left eye, okay. you can see the abducting stagmus and that medial duction of the right eye just slowly drifts across. You can also do this with see? It keeps twitching. an optokinetic drum or strip by moving the target opposite in the okay, I don't want to spend like too much on this, but I just want you guys to understand. So the purpose of the MLF and the reason we keep on bringing it up and the reason it's important in cross sections and, 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 and is because with the MLF, it allows your eyes to move fluidly and it tells your brain, hey, look to the side from here, but look medially from here. Otherwise, our movements are not going to be as fluid. So when you have a damage to that connection that's telling your oculomotor nerve to work here, and your trochlea or your abducens are nerve to work here at the same time, then there's going to be a lag and there are going to be problems like the nystagmus we saw. But I hope you guys, you know, enjoyed watching the videos because I know for a fact when you see things, you're going to be much better at remembering them, um, especially in medicine. Like I can sit and tell you about things for hours, but if you don't see it for yourself, um, it's much harder to remember. So do you guys have any questions or are you ready for a short break? before we get to, is there nystagmus on the opposite side always? Um, to my knowledge, yes, but there can be many different causes of nystagmus. So this is not the only cause, it's just what happens. So let's say if I have a lesion here, this eye, if I have a lesion here, this eye won't be able to AD duct properly. And when I look to the side, this eye is gonna have the nystagmus. Okay, you guys good for a five minute break? Almost. We're almost done. I hope you guys are proud of yourselves because I definitely am. So now that this 15 minute break is over, let's move on to the next section. So we're going to talk about trigeminal, facial, and vestibulocochlear. Very briefly, I just wanted to mention vestibulocochlear because we already know it's sensory for hearing and balance. Lesion gives you ipsilateral deafness, right? But remember our mnemonic, some say marry money, but my brother says big brains matter most. So some say marry money, but trigeminal is both, has motor and sensory. Okay. And then my brother, facial is also both, has motor and sensory. So remember, trigeminal, which we're going to start with, has three branches. And what I'm going to use is, I didn't realize I didn't introduce him in the very beginning of this pal. Um, this is my friend, Gary. Okay, I'm going to bring him a bit closer so you guys can see. So Gary is my father's skeleton from medical school. And I was going to say he's still alive, but I don't think that applies. Okay, so thank you for being our model, Gary. So basically, the trigeminal nerve goes into three places. Okay, goes here into your ophthalmic branch near the eye goes here into your maxillary branch and then a third one down here into your mandibular so you can also do that on your face okay i'm wearing glasses so it's fine work as well so you can see here basically you have your ophthalmic you have your maxillary and you have your mandibular okay and remember it's called trigeminal because it has three branches and we know it has sensory function we know it has motor function 
Okay, and we know it has those three branches. Tamam. So ophthalmic nerve is for your eye and your forehead. Okay, it's pure sensory. You have your maxillary is for your cheek and your upper teeth, which is also pure sensory. But you have your mandibular, which is here at the mandible, which means your jaw. It has sensory here for your mandible and your lower teeth, but it also supplies here the muscles of mastication, which you can feel literally if you poke into your cheek. If you start to chew, these muscles here are what are going to help contract your jaw and you know your teeth for mastication. And so that's very important. It also serves as a conduit for the parasympathetic functions of cranial nerves three, seven, as well as cranial nerve nine, which we'll see a bit later on. Okay, so. This is basically another view of this distribution. You have your ophthalmic nerve, pure sensory here to your eye. So if you touch your eyelid, it's basically going through the trigeminal tract. Remember, it's an afferent tract that goes up, but this is the ophthalmic branch. If you touch here, this is your maxillary. If you touch here, this is your mandibular, all right? And so this is cranial nerve five, but remember you have laminous chi that are going all throughout, like also in the medulla. So it's mostly in the medulla and the pond. So it's a bit of an exception to this rule, but remember, because there's a lot of different things going on. Okay, so this is your distribution. Now, this is also what it looks like. So you can see you have different ganglia. So this is your ciliary ganglion, which is parasympathetic. You have your pterygopalatine. You also have your submandibular and your otic ganglion. So the reason these are mentioned here is not because the trigeminal nerve has a parasympathetic supply, but it helps to relay parasympathetic supply of other nerves, like we mentioned, such as the hypoglossal, um, sorry, not hypoglossal, such as the glossopharyngeal, which is number nine, such as the submandibular and pterygopalatine for facial, and such as the ciliary for your um, oculomotor, which we just learned about. Okay, and you see how the nuclei are so large. And because remember when we saw the picture of the trigeminal nerve, it's this giant fat nerve. So you're bound to have a lot of nuclei in a bunch of different places. We said it's sensory and motor. So the chief sensory for touch is going to be here, chief sensory nucleus. We can see it in the pons. You also have the motor nucleus, which is also in the pons. And you have your mesencephalic nucleus, which helps with proprioception. So knowing what the positioning of your face is, essentially. Okay. You also have the spinal trigeminal nucleus, which is for pain and temperature. So this is just to show you that, yes, it has a bunch of different like motor and sensory components, but it really does have a lot of functions. It's a giant, giant nerve. Um, and I'll show you a picture on here. Okay. So you see, okay, I'll talk about the parasympathetic again in one second. All right. But I just want to show you guys, you see how big this nerve is. You can see one branch that's going here. Okay. So this is going to be your ophthalmic division. You have one branch going in here and you can see how really giant this nerve is, right? So this is your maxillary division. So that's cheek and upper teeth sensory. And then you have your mandibular division. So this goes down and supplies motor. Okay. So the muscles of mastication, chewing, as well as sensory. And to go back to what we're talking about with this is basically the trigeminal nucleus okay or the trigeminal nerve has a bunch of different nuclei but you guys see these nuclei that are in purple and blue so these are your parasympathetic ganglia so you see how they're traveling with the trigeminal nerve fibers they act as a conduit or like it helps to carry these fibers along it's not the trigeminal nerve that's giving you parasympathetic supply it's helping you carry for example the parasympathetic supply of the ciliary nerves okay or to the ciliary nerves from oculomotor nerve okay which is what we looked at remember with the light reflexes it's what's helping carry your parasympathetic supply via the pterygopalatine ganglion okay and the submandibular as well Okay, and the otic ganglion. We're going to talk about these later, but I just basically wanted to show here that it helps to carry these parasympathetic supplies. That's why um, Dr. Yaqinuddin emphasized on it here as well. So when you look at this picture, you understand, okay, why am I looking at four parasympathetic ganglia? It's because it helps to carry them along. Okay, it's not supplying, it's just helping to carry them along. Okay. 
and you have your nuclei. We said motor nucleus for the muscles of mastication right here in the jaw, your V3 branch. You have your sensory nucleus for touch either here, remember, here or here. So V1, V2, V3. All right. And you have your proprioception, mesencephalic nucleus. And remember this, the really long spinal nucleus of trigeminal that we kept seeing in the brainstem and then again in the pons. So that is for pain and temperature. Okay. I hope the parasympathetic part makes sense. So again, it's just carrying the fibers. It's not in and of itself having parasympathetic supply. It's just because, like, think of it, because it's such a big nerve and it goes everywhere, they're kind of like hitchhikers. It's like, oh, you need to go to the eye? I'm going to. Come with me. Oh, you need to go to the upper mandible? I'm going there. Come with me. That kind of thing. Okay? And to all these various different places. So that's just an easier way to think about it because it's a giant nerve. So it just helps to carry those fibers along to the same destination. Okay? And again, this is just an image to show you guys how ginormous the trigeminal nerve is do you see this see how like look at how dainty and thin the other nerves are and then you see this like very chunky looking nerve that's always going to be your trigeminal okay so let's look at what happens when you damage the trigeminal nerve okay so we know it has sensory portion and a motor portion. So let's talk about the motor portion. First, we said it supplies the muscles of mastication, the muscles that help you chew. So if you have paralysis here, there's basically paralysis of one whole side of your jaw. And what happens is if your muscles here are paralyzed, you still have muscles in the back. And so the muscles in the back are going to pull your jaw away. The unopposed pterygoid muscle here, let's say if the lesion is on this side, is going to pull your jaw like towards the side of the lesion because the muscles here are so weak and can't stabilize it. So you can see this in this patient. This is actually a patient with lower trigeminal nerve palsy. So you can see how it kind of looks like she's smiling, but she's not smiling. Her jaw is really pulled towards this side. And because you see the muscles here, the mu you can feel it in your cheek, the muscles for mastication, for chewing, these are paralyzed. So the muscles at the back basically pull your jaw. So it pulls it towards the side of the lesion. Okay. And I hope, you know, that makes sense for everyone here. So you can see how here. The mandibular nerve, which is in this side, has a motor component that supplies the muscles that are important for chewing, okay? And the V3 branch also has um, important reflexes. You have something called the jaw jerk reflex. So the afferent and the efferent both come from cranial nerve V3, right? So you have the um, cranial nerve V3 going back and then the motor efferent coming to create the jaw jerk reflex. You can also see that it's a similar concept as, for example, the biceps reflex or the triceps or the knee reflex. So jaw jerk is just one of them to test if V3 is working. Okay. So in this patient, for example, if you tried to do a jaw jerk reflex, nothing would happen because the motor branch is cut for some reason. Okay. So again, just to recap, trigeminal nerve has motor component. That motor component supplies the muscles of mastication. Mastication means chewing. Okay. If it's damaged, you have ipsilateral jaw paralysis, so jaw paralysis on the same side. Unlike this patient here, the jaw deviates towards the side of the lesion. It's pulled to the back. So in this patient here, do you think she has right-sided or left-sided paralysis of the jaw? Left-sided. Perfect, right? Because so, this is her left side. So it's pulled back, okay, because of the unopposed pterygoid muscle. And if you tried to do a jaw jerk reflex on this patient, it wouldn't work either because the motor branch to the masseter is not there. It's like a lower motor neuron lesion. Okay. Now that's for motor, right? Which you can see in the upper pons. How about the trigeminal sensory nucleus? Remember in this picture here, you can see how there's a chief sensory nucleus in the pons. There's also pain and temperature in the medulla and also partially in the pons, right? So it's a very, very giant nerve. So what happens is, first of all, it supplies touch to your face, right? So if you touch here, right, we said mag uh, ophthalmic, maxillary, mandibular, so it's supplying touch. If you have damage to this nerve, 
right? What's going to happen? You're going to lose the sensation in your face. And when you lose the sensation in your face, that's called hemianesthesia. So you lose the sensation in half your face, right? Because your right trigeminal nerve is supplying on your right side and your left trigeminal on your left side. So basically, imagine you cut your face in half and literally you cannot feel one side of your face if you touch it. That's called facial hemianesthesia, okay? And the last thing, which is also very, very important, is loss of the corneal reflex. So we talked about it briefly before, but I'm going to reiterate it again. So corneal reflex, your sensory or your afferent fibers go through cranial nerve five remember it makes sense ophthalmic branch ophthalmic means going to the eye so it makes sense that this also has sensation in your eye but okay i don't recommend doing this at home i'll show you a video but if you touch your eye if you touch your cornea what's going to happen you're going to blink right so your afferent is or your sensory fibers that are telling you hey something touched my eye something's in my eye or if i oh that horrible feeling if you've ever gotten an eyelash in your eye and immediately you blink that's your corneal reflex okay but we said the motor component is in the jaw what's causing you to close your eyes your facial nerve right your orbicularis oculi if you guys remember from anatomy that really kind of scary circular looking muscle around the eye that's supplied by your facial nerve. So it causes you to blink reflexively. Okay. So your V1 or your ophthalmic division is the afferent limb for the corneal reflex. So here in this picture, if you touch the jaw, uh, if you touch the jaw, if this patient has basically paralysis, okay, here you can see how the cheek is hollow. He has had atrophy or loss of his um, the muscles of mastication because the cranial nerve 5 is gone. And his jaw is pulled more towards this side. It's a bit difficult to see in all honesty with this picture. But another important thing is that he's going to have loss of his corneal reflex. Meaning if you touch the eye that's, you know, that has um, the, the side of the lesion, you're not going to blink because that reflex is no longer there. The sensation transmitting that, hey, someone's touching my eye or hey i have an eyelash in my eye is no longer there okay so this is a video of the corneal reflex all right i'm gonna mute it because it doesn't really matter that much what he's saying but see okay you see how when he touches it with a q-tip she starts to blink by reflex so your afferent limb is going to be the ophthalmic division of your trigeminal Okay, and what's causing you to actually close your eyes, it goes back and it tells the facial nerve, hey, blink, you need to blink, okay? Because it controls the orbicularis oculi or the circular muscle around the eye. Okay, so see how she starts to blink? Okay, so that's for the corneal reflex. Let's go back just to make sure. So let's recap. Trigeminal is a sensory and a motor nerve okay the trigeminal motor nucleus in the upper pons okay goes and then gives you v1 uh, v3 and then v3 supplies the muscles of mastication if you have v3 cut off for some reason you have ipsilateral paralysis of the jaw or your jaw is not able to move on one side and so your jaw deviates towards the side of the lesion because the muscles in the back are yanking it they're pulling it to the back and you're also going to have loss of the jaw jerk reflex, right? So remember, like this patient here, this is V3 here. So if V3 is lost, muscles of mastication are lost. It's pulled towards the side of the lesion. In this patient here, you can see, I mean, it's a picture, so it's not as clear like a drawing, but there's a scooped out appearance of his cheek, which basically shows you that there's muscle wasting there. So that's the motor part. The trigeminal sensory nuclei, which you can see here, right? There's the chief sensory nucleus in the pons, and then you have the spinal nucleus of trigeminal, so pain and temperature. So if you have um, damage to either one, you're going to get ipsilateral facial sensory loss. So on one side, the same side, hemianesthesia, you can't feel half of your face, okay? And um, you're also going to have loss of the corneal reflex. Remember, V1 is the sensory, and then it causes you to close your eyes. So that's facial nerve. Okay? And just one more time, so you guys can remember it. This is the corneal reflex. Okay? 
See how every time he touches her eye, touches the cornea, she blinks, even though she's kind of trying not to, but see, she blinks reflexively. So that tells you that the corneal reflex is intact. So V1 and the facial nerve are intact on both sides. All right. Any questions? Easy enough? Yes, no, maybe. Okay. Alhamdulillah. Right, wonderful. Now, you guys, we have... Now we're going to talk about the facial nerve, basically. All right? So the facial nerve is cranial nerve number seven. Remember, number six is the abducens, and we already talked about that with the movements of the eye. So now we're looking at the facial nerve, which is here. Because, okay, you can't really see it here, but well, it's labeled here. It's very faint. So this is your sixth. And then next to it, on the lateral side, is going to be your seventh cranial nerve. All right? So the facial nerve, we know oops, from the mnemonic, it's mixed, right? It's both motor and sensory but it also has parasympathetic supply. But you guys already knew that. How? Remember when we said cranial nerve seven supplies the submandibular and the sublingual salivary glands? So that is by um, the facial nerve. Okay. And it also supplies the lacrimal gland. So crying and salivation from submandib submandibular and sublingual glands but not the parotid gland. Parotid gland is something else, okay? We'll see that later. But so for the motor, we already know that, right? You have the five branches, which we're gonna talk about in a moment. And it also supplies stapedius, posterior belly digastric, and stylohyoid muscles. I'm not gonna go too much in depth with these because honestly, you're gonna learn them in head and neck. Um, I'll only go into what is clinically relevant for you now. Sensory is very important. It is basically what detects taste from the anterior two-thirds of your tongue via corda tympani and some sensory sensations around the ear, okay, here in the skin, but mostly taste in the anterior two-thirds. Remember, this is one of the special senses. And then parasympathetic, you have, like we mentioned, lacrimal gland via pterygopalatine ganglion, submandibular and sublingual salivary glands so for producing saliva via the submandibular ganglion v3 and why did we mention v3 remember what i told you guys before that okay because the trigeminal nerve is so big it kind of picks up hitchhikers and it's like yeah i'll take you with me that's what they mean when they say okay via pterygopalatine ganglion v2 that tells you the maxillary branch helps to carry it to the lacrimal gland okay or the submandibular and sublingual here v3 helps to carry it to these glands okay so let's look at this here so you see how even not yet this isn't even a cross section but you see how it kind of looks like spidery this is the um trochlear nerve coming from the back and because this is the back of the head okay and you can see the fat looking facial nerves uh yeah here's the facial nerve and it goes and it goes into what we call the interior acoustic um meatus so meatus just means like a hole acoustic because you know it's going towards the can it's going towards the ear okay and then all right so now we have to introduce a very important concept with the facial nerve so this is a face for the facial nerve and we know each facial nerve supplies one side so we're going to divide it in half and the first thing we're going to do is after dividing it in half, we're going to separate the forehead from the rest of the face. So you have the lower two thirds and the upper one third of the face. Okay. This is going to be your cerebral cortex on one side. This is your cerebral cortex on the other side. This is your facial nerve nucleus. Okay. You see how it has two portions and this is on each side. Now, a very important concept that I want you guys to understand is that the facial nerve okay see how this is the upper part and the lower part so this goes to the upper one third this goes to the lower two thirds so this together is the facial nerve that we just saw that goes through the internal acoustic meatus, right so this is our lower motor neuron now very important thing is that you have an upper motor neuron from the cortex we know this already right but 
do you see how there's two sides? So you have an upper motor neuron from the right cortex and from the left cortex. So that is very unusual. Not all the cranial nerves have that, right? So the key thing that happens in this case is, let's say you have a lower motor neuron lesion. You can have, okay, wait, I'll show you here. This I just want all the animations to finish. Okay, so if you have an upper motor neuron lesion, okay, you have paralysis to the contralateral lower half of the face. Okay, the, why is this the case? This looks confusing. Remember that you have a supply from one cortex, one side, right? And then you have supply from the other side. So if you have an upper motor neuron lesion here, you're going to have sparing of the forehead. But why do I have sparing of the forehead? Because the other cortex is going to supply it again. Remember, this is just an, an interesting and unique thing about the facial nerve, that it has dual supply only in the upper part, okay? But if you have damage here, it doesn't matter how many inputs you have from here. Here you have a lower motor neuron lesion. So you have ipsilateral paralysis of half of the face. So this is very important to remember. Upper motor neuron lesion, because it's supplying the other side, you're going to have contralateral paralysis of the lower two-thirds of the face. So here, sparing the forehead. Why is the forehead left alone? Because you have supply from the other cortex. Tamam? If you look at the um, lower motor neuron lesion, so here, then you have damage to the upper part and the lower part. Okay, so this is another picture from Amboss that shows it a bit better. So you see how on this side of the cortex, it's supplying this facial ganglion and this one too. And the green one is also supplying this one and this one too. So if you have damage here, you see how the purple one, although you have loss here, right? You still have dual supply on either side. So there's still a remainder of like the purple nerve from this cortex that's supplying the forehead. So you can see how he still has wrinkles in his forehead, but the lower two thirds of his face are paralyzed. This is basically what happens when you have an upper motor neuron lesion. And remember, this is contralateral. It's to the opposite side. Okay. However, if you damage the nerves here, it doesn't matter how many inputs you have, the output is not going. So you can see that half of his face is paralyzed. So this is what we call Bell's palsy. This is probably the picture that they included for you guys. And they have been including for us for a very long time. And he just reminds me of Flynn Rider, the Bell's palsy guy. But if you're looking at it, you see how this part of his forehead has no wrinkles. He's unable to, you know, close his eye or lift his eyebrow. So that tells you that there's ipsilateral paralysis of the facial nerve on this side. But if it was a lower motor neuron lesion, like this guy, his forehead would be, uh, sorry, if it was an upper motor neuron lesion, so from the brain, it would be contralateral with sparing of the forehead, okay? This is ipsilateral, and the whole face is affected, like this guy. So ipsilateral, whole face is affected, the guy that looks like Flynn Rider, yeah. Okay, does that make sense for everyone, how the facial palsies work? Because it's very important, and they ask it a lot in questions. Yes? Thank you guys for still being with me. I know it's been a very long session. This We're going to try to finish up, okay? So this is exactly what we said. Upper motor neuron lesion above the pons, contralateral spastic paralysis of the lower two thirds of the face, sparing the forehead. This is exactly what we just explained, right? If it's a lower motor neuron lesion, so at the facial colliculus, lower pons or below, um, then it's what we call Bell's palsy, ipsilateral flaccid paralysis of half of the face, including the forehead. Okay, then you have another interesting finding if the facial nerve is damaged. It's called hyperacusis. So what does that mean? So hyper meaning excessive or high and acusis coming from sound. So you have a muscle that is here. Okay, so you see this tiny little nerve. This is the muscle called the stapedius muscle in the tympanic membrane in your ear and have you guys ever went to like a really loud room or someone shouted in your ear um or maybe you went to a concert and then you left the concert and you feel like everything is like you can't hear properly you feel kind of old 
That's because of your stapedius muscle. What it does is to protect you when it detects very loud noises, it starts to dampen the sound. It starts to make everything sound um, less heightened. So when you lose the function of this muscle, everything sounds much louder than it actually is. So you have hyperacusis and these patients can be very irritated by sounds. Okay, you can also have partial loss of taste, but you already know that. Why? Because you know it supplies the anterior two-thirds of the tongue so a taste sensation, right? Um, you can also have unilateral decrease in salivation and lacrimation, meaning dry eyes, dry mouth. Why? Because it has parasympathetic supply via the superior salivatory nucleus, we know to the lacrimal gland, via the tergopalatine with V2, and submandibular and sublingual glands via the submandibular ganglion that's carried by V3, okay? Last thing is you can have ipsilateral Horner syndrome. So Horner syndrome, if you guys remember, we talked about it in the beginning, is with the S's that are to the side. So if you damage the sympathetic fibers, you're going to get partial ptosis, meiosis, and anhydrosis on the affected side. So Ptosis is, remember, like when the eyelid falls a bit. Meiosis is the pupil constricts. And I remember meiosis is pupillary constriction because like the eye looks like a tiny dot pupil, okay? And anhydrosis, meaning there's inability to sweat on that side, right? So uh, ptosis, meiosis, anhydrosis, okay? The other things that you need to know about are the two reflexes. You have the corneal reflex, but we already know about that. Why? Because we learned about it with the V1 branch, right? If you touch the cornea, it's going to blink. How are you going to blink? Because the muscle here is supplied by facial nerve, closing the eye. You also have the lacrimation reflex, which is your V1 branch as well, okay? And your efferent is the facial nerve, so it's going to cause you to tear up. It's, again, response of the eye. All right. So I just wanted to show you guys this briefly. So this is our facial nucleus. And you remember how it like wraps around the abducens nerve? We when we saw that in the cross section. So it's gonna go, this is our motor part. It's gonna give nerve to stapedius. Remember? Hyperacusis. If this is damaged, it helps to decrease sound, like if you were in a very loud room. Okay. And it's gonna go down. It's also gonna su uh, supply posterior belly of the digastric. And you're going to have your five branches. So I'm not really going to go into them. I'm going to mention you, uh, mention to you what, like just what they are. So you have um, your zygomatic, your buccal, your uh, carotid and whatnot. Um, this is your stylohyoid muscle that's also supplied by it. But what matters more than you guys knowing these branches now, because you will learn about them in head and neck, is just that you have your motor component okay you have your parasympathetic component okay and you also have your um taste from the anterior two-thirds okay so your taste tamam so this is again just to continue to recap everything okay the reason you get uh, ipsilateral horner syndrome is because there's damage to the sympathetic fibers that are carried with the facial nerve so that's what causes horner syndrome because the sympathetic fibers are going to help. Uh, remember, sympathetic nervous system, you want your eyes very wide open and you want your pupils open, midriasis, right? You want your pupils dilated. And usually you start to heat up, you start to sweat. So if you don't have the sympathetic fibers, you get partial ptosis, meiosis, and anhydrosis. Okay. And again, corneal reflex, very important. Your efferent is your... Um, facial nerve your afferent is the v1 branch of your trigeminal okay so this these are our parasympathetic nuclei okay from your superior salivatory nucleus you're gonna go here through the greater petrosal nerve to the pterygopalatine ganglion and just what you need to remember is pterygopalatine ganglion is what's gonna go to your lacrimal gland cause you to cry okay your submandibular okay uh, and also sublingual are going to go to those respective glands. So your submandibular gland and your sublingual gland. Just remember that the, the it supplies, you know, submandibular and um, 
sublingual is supplied by the seventh cranial nerve that comes from the superior salivatory nucleus. I know that's like 50 S's, but that's just an easier way to remember it, okay? And so this is, again, what we're looking at. The facial nerve is here in the lateral pons. Okay, the trigeminal is going there with them. Yes, it basically carries the fiber, so that's why it's considered a conduit. But remember, it makes sense because in these areas, it's already carrying sensory fibers. So they're carrying sensory fibers there anyway. It's not that it's not doing anything. It has sensation in these areas. But the trigeminal nerve is not supplying the parasympathetic to the parotid gland, uh, method, not parotid, sorry, to the submandibular gland or the sublingual gland or the lacrimal gland. It's just going there anyway because it has to have sensory supply, right? Like if you touch here, it's, you're going to feel it. So it's just like it's, it's just like they have, they have the same mishwar. They're going to the same place. So it's just like, yalla, come with me. Okay, that's the whole purpose of it being a conduit. Okay, again, this looks very intimidating, but don't worry. This is exactly what we looked at before. We just added the superior salivatory nucleus. You can see how it goes here. This is the pterygopalatine ganglion. Okay, and then with the V2, it's going to go here, carry it to the lacrimal. You see how this is the V2. It's going here. It's just kind of helping it. Yalla. This is where you want to go. That's what I was trying to explain. Okay, it's also going to go here. You're going to have your submandibular uh, ganglion. You're going to go to your submandibular gland, sublingual gland. But remember, it also supplies taste to the anterior two-thirds of the tongue. That was a mouthful. Okay. Do you guys want to break? Or do you guys want to keep going? Because we have a few cranial nerves left, but I know it's been a long session. So it's up to you. Keep going. Okay. Khalas. If anyone objects, just let me know. Yalla. Okay. So we finished the abducent. We finished basically all of these. The rest are actually very easy. So don't worry. We're at the home stretch. I know. <laughs> okay. So now we're going to talk about glossopharyngeal, vagus, accessory, and hypoglossal. All right. So remember. Glossopharyngeal and vagus are both big brains, okay? Accessory and hypoglossal are purely motor. So remember how I told you the submandibular and sublingual glands are supplied by cranial nerve 7, okay? There's one more gland that's left when we talk about a salivation, and that's the parotid gland. And this is actually supplied by the glossopharyngeal nerve. Okay, and we're going to see, basically, these are the two major nerves you need to know. These two are very easy. Okay, I added this picture here from first aid so you guys can compare and see. So we know this is here oculomotor. So here we can see the vagus nerve and the hypoglossal. They're kind of leaving together so you don't really differentiate the fibers. But this is, okay, do you see the basilar artery? That's what this is here. Okay, and then if you go here in the middle, this is the anterior spinal. So you guys just get a better understanding when you look at these pictures. But now let's move on to the nerves, okay? So the glossopharyngeal nerve, we said it's both motor and sensory. And we know because it supplies the parotid gland, it's parasympathetic. Okay. So motor is to one muscle, the stylopharyngeus, which elevates the pharynx. Okay. So pharyngeus for pharynx. Sensory is general sensory, which is sensation to the posterior one third of the tongue, the pharynx, the palatine tonsils, the carotid sinus and the body for the carotid sinus reflex. I know that's a handful, but remember what I told you guys in the beginning, the name, glosso meaning tongue, pharyngeal meaning pharynx. So it makes sense that this gives a sensation to the tongue and the pharynx, okay? And the part of the tongue that's near the pharynx is the posterior part, like the posterior one-third. So it's also going to give us taste to the posterior one-third of the tongue, Okay. Another important thing about it, which we're going to go through it again, don't worry, it regulates the gag reflex. So it's the afferent limb, okay, the sensory limb for the gag reflex. We're going to see what the motor limb is in a bit, but again, so motor to stylopharyngeus, general sensory to the posterior one-third of the tongue, pharynx, palatine tonsils, carotid sinus, and body. So this is for the carotid sinus reflex, which you guys learned about in CBP, so don't worry about it now. And it also regulates the gag reflex, which is very important. 
for special senses. It's taste to the posterior one-third of the tongue. Okay. Parasympathetic is, remember, parotid gland by the otic ganglion. All right. So now, this is what I was trying to tell you. You see how this is the tongue and this is the anterior. This is the posterior. So anything in green is the glossopharyngeal. So it supplies taste to the posterior one-third of the tongue. Okay. And it also supplies sensation to the posterior part of the tongue. All right. And the pharynx. Okay. And the keratids and etc. etc. So it has two main nuclei. There's the nucleus solitarius, which is sensory. Okay. And we know it's in the upper medulla. Why? Because we know this nerve is in the upper medulla. So it makes sense. Okay. And you have your nucleus ambiguous. Remember this and how I told you it was very important. So glossopharyngeal nerve has a very minor role to play in swallowing, but it's still there. Okay. Um, but what's more important is because you have this, you're going to have mild difficulty in swallowing, mild dysphagia. Okay. And you're going to have loss of taste over the posterior aspect of the tongue. Why? Because we know it supplies the posterior aspect of the tongue, right? One third. So if it's damaged, you're going to lose taste here. Okay. You're going to lose sensation here. But what's more important is you're going to lose your gag reflex. And this is the main way we can test this clinically. Like, I think everyone has had that experience where you've been brushing your teeth and then you go to brush your tongue and then you start to gag. Yeah, that's because of your glossopharyngeal nerve sending signals back that, hey, something is here. And so it causes you to gag in order to, you know, get that out, whatever foreign pathogen you think it is. And it's regulated the efferent limb is mostly by cranial nerve 10. And it's all supposed to be nine. I don't know why. Yeah. So when you test for the gag reflex, you're basically testing the intactness of the nucleus ambiguous. Is your motor response adequate or not? Okay. So this is again what we're looking at, cranial nerve nine. And so again, this is just so you guys know what this slide means when you look at it. We know that you have the uh, inferior salivatory nucleus. Remember, superior is for the seventh cranial nerve, which is facial. Inferior is for glossopharyngeal. Okay, so this goes and supplies the parotid gland via the otic ganglion. And they've asked about this before, so make sure you know this. Okay, parotid gland via the otic ganglion. You also have your nucleus ambiguous, which is motor. Okay, which we should know. Um, you have your nucleus tractus solitarius, which is general sensory, okay? You have your spinal trigeminal nucleus, which is going to carry as well as um, your, uh, wait, sorry, nucleus tractus solitarius is going to give your taste, and then the other spinal trigeminal is going to give your sensory. It's color-coded here. Also gives supply to your keratid sinus and body. Again, I know it's very complicated. Main thing I want you to know, taste in the posterior, one third of the tongue also, which is here. And you lose your gag reflex. Okay, those are the two main things. Partial loss of taste and loss of gag reflex. Those are the two most important things you need to know for glossopharyngeal. Okay, and the third most important thing is that the parotid gland is supplied by the otic ganglion from the inferior salivatory nucleus okay so those are just the key things because otic ganglion they have asked about before okay and don't confuse remember superior is for superior salivatory is for seven that supplies the submandibular and sublingual glands okay but the otic ganglion is for your glossopharyngeal okay so inferior salivatory Otic ganglion, parotid gland. So just remember it in that way. Okay. Do you guys have any questions or do we go to Vegas? Almost, almost, almost done. Go to Vegas. Yalla. Home stretch, huh? This is what we were looking at before. Same picture. You can see this is the Vegas. Okay. You see how it goes down and then the vagus really does a lot. See how it goes down here 
and then it exits and it's important for the carotids it's important for your heart it's important for your gi just keeps going down okay okay wonderful so vagus we know is both motor and sensory also has parasympathetic but you guys already knew that because it supplies parasympathetic and literally all of the gi right and also bear a receptor to hollow organs so stomach and bowel okay so the main thing that i want you guys to remember is it supplies the motor supply to the muscles of the palate the pharynx and the larynx so it's one of the very key muscles for swallowing so you'll notice that what happens when it's damaged is you get severe dysphagia and dysarthria because basically the pa you, you have difficulty speaking and difficulty swallowing but unlike the hypoglossal nerve which causes mild dysphagia this causes severe dysphagia okay um also has sensory supply to the eardrum but again this is not as relevant for you guys right now okay this is what i want you to know we said the main motor is nucleus ambiguous okay and remember this is like the um, it's ambiguous because it supplies motor to a lot of cranial nerves and whatnot okay so you get dysphagia and dysarthria okay and the key clinical clue is that you get deviation of the uvula which is this it's normally in the middle right so it deviates towards the affected uh, sorry uh, away from the affected side and this part of the soft palate basically is unable to lift up and you can see this actually here in this clinical picture you see how the uvula should be in the middle but it's deviated to this side so you know the lesion is on the other side the uvula deviates away from the side of the lesion okay um, you also get hoarseness because you have the recurrent laryngeal nerve so that can cause hoarseness uh, when it's because it's a branch of the vagus you also remember, lose your gag reflex. Why is this important? We said in the last couple of slides, gag reflex tests your nucleus ambiguous. And if, let's say, you keep on stimulating the glossopharyngeal to say, hey, I'm like, let's say something, this tongue depressor is getting way too close to your uvula or something, but your vagus nerve is not working, you're going to get the sensory input that, like, hey, I want to gag, for example, but you won't be able to because the motor function is not intact. And it's the same thing with the cough reflex. Let's say you drink some water and you accidentally like drink, drank it too quickly and then you start to cough. That's because of your vagus nerve. It's regulating a lot of those muscles. But if it's not working, then you're not going to be able to cough as a reflex. And people can have aspiration and get pneumonia because of this. Okay, so remember, gag reflex, glossopharyngeal is sensory efferent is mainly vagus can also be spinal accessory but mostly vagus okay okay how can we tell that the loss of uh, gag reflex is because of nucleus ambiguous or other nerves okay the main nerve for the gag reflex is going to be your vagus nerve but let's say how do i differentiate vagus nerve versus glossopharyngeal okay first of all usually they're going to come together when it comes to strokes just letting you know that uh, unless it's in specific scenarios okay but remember in vagus nerve palsy specifically you're going to have failure of this part to rise and you're going to have deviation of the uvula away from the lesion Okay, so this is going to be our characteristic here. But if you look, wait, I'm going to go back to the slide. Oh, I'm going to have to go through these animations. Okay, but if you have that as well as loss of taste over the posterior aspect of the tongue, then you start to think, okay, I'm probably dealing with glossopharyngeal or loss of general sensation in the back of the pharynx. Then you're going to think, okay, glossopharyngeal. All right. I hate these like 50 animations. I'm sorry. Okay. Does that make sense? And if it's a uh, spinal accessory, you're going to see how the palsy works in a second. Okay. This is again, you see how vagus has like a billion fibers. So baroreceptor mostly in the abdomen, parasympathetic in the thorax and the abdomen, right? Going to the heart. This is our cricothyroid muscle. You're going to have your laryngeal nerves. Like it's basically the vagus is really doing the most. It's going everywhere. 
your nucleus ambiguous, remember, is the motor. Nucleus tractus solitarius is going to be our sensory, as well as the spinal nucleus of the trigeminal. So all of these work together to basically cause the vagus to do what it does best, which is, these are the key things you need to know. Tama? Okay. Now, I promise you, we're almost, almost, almost done. So get excited. Now, we have the spinal accessory nerve. Remember what I told you it does? You shrug your shoulders and you look to the side. Okay? So, again, nucleus ambiguous is very important. That's why it's so vague because it's so huge. Okay? Um, and the spinal accessory nucleus, which arises under. So what happens when it's damaged is you're going to have, it, first of all, ipsilateral shoulder droop. Your trapezius is this giant triangle-shaped muscle that you guys know is here. So when there's paralysis on this side, you can see how his shoulder is much lower than the other one. It's also clear here how this shoulder is dropped down in comparison to the other one. That's because of spinal accessory nerve paralysis. The other problem you're going to have is because you lost the function of your sternocleidomastoid, you can't turn your head away from the side of the lesion. Why? Because when I turn my head to the left, my right sternocleidomastoid is contracting. When I turn my head to the right, my left sternocleidomastoid is contracting. So you're basically unable to look to the side away from the lesion. Okay easy enough this one is quite simple so just remember the shoulder drops and you can't look to the other side okay that's for spinal accessory so you can see it here it comes from the nucleus ambiguous it's purely motor and it's going to go sternocleidomastoid and trapezius okay that's all you guys need to know and finally very very last but not least is our hypoglossal nerve okay so it comes from the hypoglossal nucleus, which is found in the medulla, all right? And hypoglossal nerve, remember, hypo, under, glossal, the tongue. So this is the nerve that's primarily responsible for the movement of the tongue. And so what happens is if it, let's say, it's cut off on one side, you can't move your tongue, okay? You, you have an inability to move your tongue. And the tongue deviates towards the side of the lesion. And I know it's going to get a, a very confusing. As, okay, this one is away. This one is towards. How do I remember them? Remember that there's, first of all, muscles in the back that are still pulling your tongue to that side. But a nice mnemonic is you lick your wounds. Okay? So in this case, do you guys think the lesion is on the left side or on the right side? I know it's been a long day, but like bear with me for the last. It's okay. Okay. So for this side, remember, this is the, the right of the patient, or your right is the left side of the patient. So this is L, this is left, this is right. Okay. So remember the mnemonic, you lick your wounds. So the tongue is going towards the side of the lesion. So this is actually a left-sided hypoglossal nerve lesion. Adi, don't worry, make mistakes now. It is your right to, and it is actually better for your learning. I hope you, like if you make a mistake, you're going to remember it. So don't worry. Okay. Here, if it's in the midline, is this side right-sided lesion or left-sided lesion? What do you guys think? Yes. Amazing. Right side. I'm glad you guys are still awake and still with me. I'm sorry it's been so long. Okay, so basically that's what happens. So the protruded tongue deviates towards the side of the lesion because there's a muscle in the back called the genioglossus muscle and it pulls the tongue forward and to the other side. Okay, so remember, you lick your wounds. And so this is where it goes. Okay, it supplies other muscles in the neck and whatnot, but this is mainly what we're talking about. The hypoglossal nucleus, it's the only one without the nucleus ambiguous, huh? For in the medulla. Everything else has nucleus ambiguous as motor. So here, hypoglossal goes to the muscles of the tongue. And we're done. I hope you guys understand the brainstem. I know it's been a long lecture, but خلاص, we got to the end. We, we covered all the content. All that I'm going to do now is I'm going to recap. Okay. So remember this mnemonic. Oh, once one takes the anatomy final, very good vacations start happening, which is so real. So remember, olfactory, 
You have one nose, two eyes. So olfactory, optic, oculomotor, okay, trochlear, trigeminal, so the face, abducens to abduct, okay, facial, facial expression, vestibulocochlear, hearing and balance, glossopharyngeal, taste in the posterior one third of the tongue, as well as sensation in the pharynx. Remember, tongue, glossopharyngeal, tongue, pharynx, vagus, which does many, many things, okay, parasympathetic, motor, remember for now, very important in swallowing, okay, spinal accessory, shrugging, turning your head to the side, and hypoglossal is muscles of the tongue. All right, again, the rule of fours. The nerves, we have 12 cranial nerves. Anything divides evenly into 12 is medial in the midline. Anything that doesn't is lateral. And you have four nerves from the midbrain, four from the pons, four from the medulla. One and two don't count though. Okay, so three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. If you draw this in front of you and you know your motor tracts are midline and your sensory tracts are to the side, then khalas, you're golden, all right? And you're going to see this especially applies to the strokes lecture um, that Fues is going to give you guys. And I told, like, we, we discussed it and he's using the rule of fours as well because it makes your life a lot easier. Tamam. Now, last key rule, remember, how do you differentiate the cross sections? The olive is in the medulla. So olive and fourth ventricle, medulla. Fourth ventricle, no olive, pons. Aqueduct, so like no fourth ventricle at all, we know it's the midbrain. Okay? Halas. I know this looks scary. This is everything we just said. Uh, this table is courtesy of Rafi Mutawa. He made it when he was in neuro last year. And it basically gives you everything. The nerve, the nucleus, the function, what happens. Okay, so this is just a summary slide for you guys. I'm not going to go through it again, but just remember, like this is the key, key things you need to know. If you want to like take something and memorize it, this is what you do. Okay, like these last few slides that I gave you, huh? So like this, rule of fours, key rules, and this table. Okay, and last thing just to include because they can be confusing is the corneal reflexes. So this is again what we talked about. The pupillary, the gag, kullu. Tamam. Do you have any questions? <laughs> I have MCQs if you guys want to solve them. If you don't, I can, you know, do them on, on another day. Um, because I know it's been a very, very long lecture, but ya rab, ya rab, you guys thoroughly understand the brainstem now and it becomes infinitely easier. Questions? Mustaiddin? Okay. Khalas. All right. These are um very similar, similar to questions that Al Faisal has gotten previously, if you know what I mean. Okay, let's start with question one. Patient after a stroke presented with loss of pain and temperature over his right side of the face. Which one of the following nuclei is responsible for this presentation? What do you guys think it is? Again, I will emphasize this a million times. Please get things wrong. I encourage you to. You're going to remember it much better that way. Okay. Okay. Let's do it by elimination. First of all, you guys are right. Okay. But let's let's go through it so we understand why is this the answer. So first we have pain and temperature. So pain and temperature is carried by which tract? Nucleus ambiguous, we know is the main motor right? The main motor nucleus in the medulla. So it's not that, okay? Nucleus gracilis, okay, is going to be for, it's part of the dorsal column, okay? Substantia gelatinosa is basically in the spinal cord, like the squishy part in the center, the part of the gray matter, that's what the substantia gelatinosa is, okay? And so the answer here is the spinal trigeminal nucleus, okay? Wait, let me just, sorry, open it from here. Why is it like this? Okay. So the answer here is going to be our uh, spinal trigeminal nucleus. Uh, nucleus tractus solitarius is only special sensory from what I remember. Um, yes, it is. It's, a sen it's mainly sensory, but it's not for pain and temperature. That's mainly the spinal trigeminal. Because remember, we're talking about the face. Okay, so that's one question. 
Now, a 40-year-old man is having difficulty speaking and swallowing. Which one of the following nuclei is responsible for his presentation? Okay, amazing. Now, let me up this question for you guys. Which one of the following, or which nerve would cause this patient to have severe dysphagia? Vagus, okay. Which nerve damage would cause them to have milder dysphagia? Hypotalsa, okay. But remember, if there's nucleus ambiguous damage, you already lost the hypoglossal and the uh, vagus nerve because both of the motor components are supplied by nucleus ambiguous. So you have to name your right, hypoglossal. So remember, nucleus ambiguous, uh, sorry, not hypoglossal, glossopharyngeal. Nice, glossopharyngeal. Thank you for correcting me. It's been a long day. Um, I'll show you in this image, wait. See, so here, I meant glossopharyngeal. <laughs> Um, so here, nucleus ambiguous is going to help with stylopharyngeus muscle in swallowing. It's also very important for swallowing via the vagus. Okay, so just keep that in mind. And Tayyip, other, other question. Um, if the nucleus ambiguous is damaged, will you have a problem with the afferent or efferent limb of the gag reflex? Efferent, excellent, because efferent is motor. So basically, you're going to start. You're going to have the sensory component, which is the glossopharyngeal, is going to go back, but you're not going to have the motor component that causes you to respond to it. Okay, new question. The accommodation reflex is through. Okay, excellent. Ciliary ganglion is for which nerve? Perfect. Yes, the Edinger-Westphal nucleus. So you get the Edinger-Westphal nucleus, goes with the oculomotor to the ciliary ganglion, and then that relays the parasympathetic fibers onto the eye, right? The ciliary muscles and the sphincter pupillae. So inferior colliculus, remember, inferior colliculus is auditory. Okay, so these are for your auditory reflexes. Your superior colliculus is to see, so that's your visual reflexes. And your superior salivatory nucleus is for cranial nerve seven, which is your uh, facial nerve, okay? So these are what all the reflexes are for, are for. But the answer to this, you guys are right, is ciliary ganglion. Okay, get the next. The parasympathetic ganglion of the glossopharyngeal nerve is... Okay. Since you got it right, which um, gland is this going to? Okay, parotid. Excellent. Um, which nucleus is it coming from? You know it. I know you guys know it. If the superior salivatory nucleus is for cranial nerve 7, then what's left? Inferior salivatory. Perfect. You guys, you don't need me to help with the brainstem. You know everything. Um, glossopharyngeal. Yeah. Inferior salivatory. Let me double check for you guys. But it should be. It should be. This is the facial. The superior salivatory is for your, wait, are you asking V? Okay, V is the pterygoid ganglion that is going to your lacrimal gland to the eye. Remember the one that's carried by V2? And then your facial nerve is what goes there with it. Okay, your submandibular and sublingual both come from the sub, uh, is with the seventh cranial nerve. And it's carried by V3. But for the glossopharyngeal, oh, you're asking for A. A is, yes, glossopharyngeal nerve goes to the, um, or has the inferior salivatory nucleus relaying to the otic ganglion, okay? And then the otic ganglion goes to the parotid gland. Lacrimation is by facial nerve. Yeah, lacrimation is by facial nerve. Because remember, the parasympathetic supply from the facial nerve goes to three places. The 
submandibular, sublingual gland. That's why it's cranial nerve seven. And the other one is lacrimation by the pterygopalate or the pterygoid ganglia. Okay. That's amazing. You guys are doing like actually amazing, inshallah. But yeah, this question is a bit longer, so I'm going to read it out. Um, 40 year old male who has been suffering from a disorder of unknown origin comes to his physician and complains that he has difficulty producing a smile from the left side of his face and he can't salivate or produce tears from the left eye. Okay, so all on one side. Further analysis showed some loss of taste and that the affected muscles were flaccid and the eyelids were open. Okay. The paraganglionic parasympathetic fibers of the nerve involved in this case arise from which of the following? Digiga, digiga. Before you answer, before you tell me A, B, C, D, E, okay? What, what is happening here? What does this patient have? Palsy of which nerve? Facial nerve palsy. Is it upper motor neuron or is it lower motor neuron? Okay. How do you know it's lower motor neuron? Perfect. Whole half of the face. And we know it's flaccid paralysis, right? It's not um, spastic paralysis because upper motor neuron is always spastic. Okay. So they're asking the paraganglionic parasympathetic fibers. So we know, like, let's, let's say what we know. We know that inferior salivatory is for hypoglossal, right? We know ellinger westphal is for cranial nerve 3. And ciliary ganglion is basically, it goes from edinger westphal to ciliary. And we know the nucleus tractus solitarius is going to be our sensory. So just by that alone, what is the only answer that we're left with? B, right? Tayyip. If we didn't want to do it by elimination, we know that this is a palsy of the seventh cranial nerve. And we know the seventh cranial nerve has the superior salivatory nucleus that supplies the submandibular and the sublingual glands. <laughs> I really, I have to say this when I say this, but I hope you guys remember it. <laughs> Literally. Okay, so you don't forget it, okay, in the exam, inshallah. And in the future, like for the rest of your med school and post-med school careers. Okay. Okay, so you guys are right. It is superior salivatory. Now, next question, okay? And I want to make sure that you guys really understand this based on the rule of force, okay? So I kept it here for you guys. This is more of a stroke question, but I just want to show you that if you understand the anatomy, you understand everything, okay? If you know the rule of force, khalas. So a 15-year-old girl is brought to the clinic by her mother because she is experiencing right-sided weakness in her face. Her mouth was pulled to the left. There was weakness of her right facial muscles. There was normal sensation on her face. Her right eye was deviated med medially and she was unable to abduct it. Okay. She has had, she also has spastic paralysis of her arm and leg. At which site was the lesion? Okay, before we answer. Oh my God, ignore this. I'm so sad. Like, before we answer, her mouth was pulled to the left and there was weakness of her right facial muscles. Okay, so what is this? Mouth was pulled to the left, weakness of her right facial muscles. This is facial nerve. And one of you guys asked me this question before and I hope this clarifies what I was talking about, okay? There is normal sensation on her face. So it's not trigeminal, okay? Her eye was deviated medially and she was unable to abduct it. What palsy is this? Sixth, right? Abducence, she can't abduct it, okay? She also has spastic paralysis of her left arm and leg. Okay, so remember when I told you guys the motor syndromes or the motor tract are midline? Okay, so this is pyramidal tract. So actually, where this lesion is, is it's affecting our sixth cranial nerve. It's affecting our seventh cranial nerve. And if we're in the pons, you already had the decussation. So basically, you're going to have your right-sided pons, right? And it's going to be what we call like ventromedial. So in the middle, but also in the front. That's why the facial nerve is also affected. Okay, so what I was trying to show you guys is if you have this written in front of you, 
you already know where it is. We know it's not the medulla because they didn't talk about swallowing problems or this R3 or whatever. Okay, so it doesn't make sense. We, we definitely know it's not the midbrain because they didn't mention anything about ocular motor or trochlear. We know there's an abducens nerve palsy because she's unable to abduct her eye. Okay, and there's a facial nerve palsy because, you know, her mouth was pulled to the left. She had weakness in her right facial muscles. And it's always ipsilateral. Okay, make sense? Easy? Ish. Inshallah. Okay, amazing. Yeah, we have two more questions. And this actually came in a previous OSCE. OSP. You guys don't have OSCEs yet. Okay. Patient presented with ptosis of the right eyelid, lateral strabismus, and loss of accommodation. Okay. He also presented with left hemiparesis of the body. Okay. So we said left hemiparesis of the body. Now, ptosis of the right eyelid, lateral strabismus, and loss of accommodation. What is this? Which nerve is affected here? Cranial nerve three. Perfect. All right. Now, if he had left hemiparesis, hemiparesis, so this is going to be one of the sensory tracts. Okay. So, first of all, this picture in the right, on the left. Okay. Where is this? Is this pons? Is this midbrain? Is this medulla? What am I looking at here? This is the midbrain. Perfect, huh? And you know because we don't see any fourth ventricle, right? You see the aqueduct. All right, but what about this one on the right? What we can see is we can see the olives, right? And we can see a fourth ventricle. So immediately, we know it's the medulla. We don't have to memorize anything. Just those simple rules. This nerve in the medulla is most likely going to be the 12th cranial nerve, the hypoglossal, which is going to cause tongue deviation, whatever. So it doesn't make sense that it's here, right? However, on this side, remember, what nerve is this that's coming out from the midbrain from the front that kind of looks like spider? This is the third cranial nerve, right? So we know this makes sense. She has, or he has, uh, oculomotor nerve palsy and left hemiparesis. So part of the sensory tracts are affected. So we know the only way that this lesion makes sense is if it's here in area C. Okay. Area A doesn't make sense either. They didn't mention anything about all the spinal tract and the red nucleus and whatever. So we know that this the answer is C. The patient can have ataxia, yes, but the hemiparesis just means loss of sensation. Like or hemiparesis, sorry. Um hemiparesis is like hemiparalysis. So you have loss of uh, motor movements on one side of the body. Hemi anesthesia is like I'll, I'll list you guys the terms if you want. But you know, it's it's like paralysis on one side of the body. So we know it has to be medial. And we know it has to affect the oculomotor nerve. So regardless, the answer is C. And we know that because one, we know how to differentiate the cross section. Two, we know that motor is medial and sensory is to the side. And we know the rule of fours. So we know from which cranial nerve, like which section do each cranial nerves come out from. Okay. Thank you. Last question. I I hope. Hello, I tell you last question and it's actually, yeah, it is the last question. Okay. Like a 55, and this is from Ambos. Okay. So I know it might be a bit more challenging, but I know you guys can solve it. Okay. A 55-year-old woman comes with the physician because of a five-month history of weakness on the left side of her face, loss of taste, as well as dryness and redness of her left eye. Okay, so before we continue, which nerve is affected here? Weakness on her left side of her face, uh, dry eyes, dry mouth. Okay. Remember, trigeminal is sensory. You're right, Amani, but it's not for taste. Taste is something else. What do you guys think it is? Okay. So, okay. Ninth is an excellent guess, but remember, ninth is the posterior one-third of the tongue. The most place you're going to taste from is the front, which is your facial right? Because the anterior two-thirds of your tongue are the facial nerve, and the posterior one-third only is from the um, glossopharyngeal nerve. So although you're technically right, 
But in this case, if you're pairing it with weakness of the left side of her face, right, like one side is weak and loss of taste, as well as dryness of her and redness of her left eye, that goes more with facial. Because remember, facial supplies the motor on one side, anterior two thirds of the tongue, taste, as well as parasympathetic to the lacrimal gland. Okay, she has no serious uh, history of serious illness, takes no medication. She's unable to puff out her left cheek and close her left eye. So this is again, facial. Okay, because the orbicularis oculi isn't working. Anyway, etc, etc, etc. She has a mass. Which one of these areas is most likely involved in this case? So do we all agree that it's facial nerve? Okay, great. I know you guys answered correctly, but I'm going to explain this anyway on the figure. So here in the back, usually we see the cranial nerve one. So this that you see with the X, this is our optic two. Let's just do it by counting. This is three, oculomotor. Four is trochlear, comes from the back, but this is from the midbrain. So yeah, this makes it easier for you guys to see. This is the pons. We know what's in the middle, the obduces, cranial nerve six. This is five. You see how big the trigeminal is because it's such a huge nerve. And then we said five, six, seven, eight, okay? And then you start counting the rest. Nine, 10, 11, 12. So cranial nerve seven is, you guys are correct, D. I just wanna show you how easy it is to do this when you can actually just count, you know? Like one, two, three, four, five, خلاص. you know what it is. You know where the lesion is. You know what's in the midbrain. You know what's in the pons. You know what's in the medulla. Hatta, you, you would know if you put, okay, I know the first medial one is six. This is five. So this has to be seven. Okay. And then E would be eight. All right. So this is just labeled again. So you guys are right. This one is the facial nerve. Must be the cochlear. And then you go down glossopharyngeal, vagus, accessory. This is hypoglossal. Okay. I hope you guys enjoyed this really long lecture. Um, thank you so much for those who attended. Inshallah, you benefited. And this is how I felt after I prepared this lecture for you guys. So I hope this is actually how you see the world after understanding the brain brainstem lecture. Thank you guys for attending. And it is my pleasure. And I am very glad that I got to do for you what I wish I had for myself in second year. Because the brainstem was suffering and then suffering and then some more suffering. So I'm very glad you enjoyed it. And now, everyone, please go take a nap. And uh, yeah, have a lovely weekend. And this is effectively a cat taking a nap. Thank you, guys. Do you have any questions, by the way? If you have any questions, like feel free to email me. I'm more than happy to help with anything you need. Just give me a call or... Send me an email and we'll figure it out. Dr. Alissa, this is you one semester. It's crazy, guys. I'm graduating. That seems unreal. Subhanallah. Inshallah khair. Ah. Oh.